Hi, good morning, Miss Moore. Hi, good morning, Ms. Moore. Thanks for joining us. I can't hear you. I'm gonna unmute you for just a moment just to make sure that we can hear you when it comes time for you to speak. Hold on one moment. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Moore. Hi, hi, can, hi. Am I clear? I can't see myself. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Can you see me?
Good morning, and to welcome everybody and to thank the witnesses for joining us for this important hearing this morning. Certainly, it is timely. We are holding today's hearing in the committee hearing room and via the WebEx platform in compliance with the rules and regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Before we begin, let me remind members of a few procedures to keep the proceedings running smoothly. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep the microphones of those present on the WebEx platform muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for questioning. Committee staff will mute members only in the event of an inadvertent background noise. In addition, when members are present in the proceeding via WebEx, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. And with that, I want to welcome uh, members and our esteemed witnesses to the Ways and Means Committee. We haven't gathered uh, since the tragic and untimely passing of our dear colleague, Jackie Wolarski. As chair of the Worker and Family Support Committee, Jackie at that time was a force and then in the minority as well. She was steadfast in her commitment to our nation's children and families. The room feels the emptiness without her booming laugh and bright smile. And as just before we proceed to a moment of silence, I want to defer to Danny Davis and then uh, the ranking member, Mr. Brady, to offer uh, words of condolence to the family. And uh, Danny Davis told us this morning in the caucus, a very moving moment, how he had attended the funeral of Jackie and felt a real loss. Is Danny? Danny? Okay, well, we'll proceed to Mr. Brady then, the ranking member. Well, first, thank you, Chairman Neal, for this moment and to Dr. Davis as well uh, for your not just kind words, but sincere efforts to, to honor and work with the Jackie and her legacy. So I, I want to recognize that, as the Chairman did, we are missing, missing a very important member of the Ways and Means Committee today, and this hearing won't be the same without her. Congresswoman Jackie Wolorski was, as she would tell you, a happy Hoosier with a passion and a joy for life that could light up a room. Her Midwestern values of hard work, fairness, and kindness were a model for our members on both sides. And there was nothing she couldn't do. She was a tough, fearless advocate for her district. She was always a champion for vulnerable children and families as leader of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support. I, along with the entire Ways and Means team of members and professional staff, extend our deepest condolences to her husband, Dean, the Walorski family, as well as the families of her staffers, Emma and Zach, who was lost in the same accident as well. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brady. So now we will turn to today's hearing, the future of U.S.-Taiwan trade. Congress is, and I want to remind all of the uh, responsibility that we have, Congress has been given the exclusive authority to regulate foreign commerce by the Constitution. This constitutional power is unique and only held by the legislative branch. It is this committee as the chief trade policy authors in the House and that has led on these issues for centuries. And when considering what's to come, that responsibility begins here with us. Turning to the topic before us, this hearing symbolizes our interest in a deeper trade relationship with Taiwan. I know on this committee there is strong bipartisan support for those words. We want to deepen our ties. Formalizing these efforts to build more durable ties will have benefits for both the United States and Taiwan. The people of Taiwan have built a robust and thriving democracy. In fact, it is a beacon of democracy in Asia. Recently, they've faced incredible pressure from their authoritarian neighbor, China. In the face of this aggression, along with Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine, this committee stands with the people of Taiwan, as we do with the people of the Ukraine. As my colleagues and I recently said on the floor of the House when we passed legislation to address Russia's aggression, we unequivocally stand with democracy and our partners. Now it's time to extend the same support to Taiwan. One way to do so is by enhancing our economic engagement. Taiwan's vibrant democracy and its high level of development allows us to aim high. And as we will hear today, there are labor challenges, but also opportunities to address those concerns. We want to set new standards and build on this incredible success that we've witnessed with USMCA as well. We start this process with our eyes wide open. 
Increased trade activity must also be paired with increases in worker and environmental protections while holding both corporations and governments accountable. Regardless of the geopolitical and geostrategic imperative, any final agreement with Taiwan will be ultimately determined by those standards. The path forward is bright, and I'm confident an agreement can be reached. I believe that the United States is ready to step up to the plate to deliver on behalf of Taiwan. The American people and democracies across the world share that sentiment. This hearing is a key aspect of U.S. engagement. As I mentioned at the top, U.S. trade policy starts with the Ways and Means Committee. And I believe that this bipartisan hearing will start to build a public record on the future of U.S.-Taiwan trade that will lead to deeper economic relationship with one of our most important partners. And with that, let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal, for holding this important hearing. Thank you to the witnesses for joining us here today. It is a great pleasure to have Russell Baining from my home state of Texas testifying before the committee once again. Uh, welcome. The U.S. and Taiwan have many shared values in a, in a robust trade relationship. Congress has long supported stronger trade engagement with Taiwan, including for decades under our bilateral trade investment framework agreement. I don't think it's ever been more important than now to intensify this engagement as China continues its economic aggression throughout the Asia Pacific and the world. For me, I think it's been frustrating that the Biden White House has refused to counter China's economic aggression and predatory trade practices, instead sits on the trade sidelines, imposing uh, a, a basically a moratorium on new U.S. trade agreements, which allows China to shape agreements that advantage its farmers, its workers, its manufacturers, and its tech companies over Americans. Our country can't be viewed as serious about pursuing a trade agreement with Taiwan if President Biden continues to oppose trade promotion authority to authorize the president to negotiate trade agreements that achieve Congress's objectives. The U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade is welcome, but it's not enough. The Biden administration's unsatisfying new trade approach focuses on working groups, frameworks, and dialogues, but that's not enough. I fear if we remain on this course, we won't reach the concrete outcomes and meaningful enforcement that ensure open trade and, and lift populations out of poverty. These shortcomings have, I think, only made things harder here at home. American workers and small businesses have been struggling in this cruel economy for far too long. Instead of working to level the playing field and strengthen our economy, the President has insisted instead on higher taxes, on made America manufacturers, lavish subsidies, to discourage the jobless from reconnecting to work and a trade moratorium that surrenders to our global competitors. To strengthen our economy, we need more workers and we need more customers that come from trade. We know that we can work together on trade in a bipartisan way as we did with the U.S.-Mexico-Can agreement, one which Chairman Neal and our Democrat colleagues were key to finalizing. We've seen how the ability to buy, sell, and compete anywhere in the world can lift people up, communities up, American workers up. We have, I think, a very strong U.S. Trade Representative and Ambassador, Ty, and I believe that if she were put to work opening new markets for American businesses, reducing trade barriers, strengthening supply chains, and enforcing trade rules, all vital to putting America first, would have a, a serious economic impact, a positive one for us. USMC helped us achieve that with their neighbors, but more must be done to open markets and strengthen supply chains in Taiwan and around the world. America ought to be leading the world by negotiating cutting-edge new trade agreements. It's time for the administration to get serious about engaging with Taiwan and other key partners in the Indo-Pacific region or risk the United States being cut out of these countries that increasingly rely on other trading partners. I do support Ambassador Tai's increased engagement with Taiwan throughout the region, but again, frameworks and dialogues are no substitute for trade agreements. As the chairman said, the Constitution vests Congress with authority to regulate commerce for nations. Any framework or other trade agreement that's not approved by Congress is legally dubious and won't result in the durable trade policies that reliably create new opportunities for our farmers, our small businesses, and our workers. I am, as many Republicans are, an ardent supporter of strengthening ties with Taiwan. The Trump administration did make solid progress for certain U.S. exports such as beef and pork. Now, Taiwan must step up to ensure American exporters and investors are treated fairly 
and, and abide by the trade commitments it's already made. If it does so, I would support pursuing a comprehensive trade agreement with Taiwan. The Trade Promotion Authority should not have been allowed to expire because it forecloses any prospect of new trade agreements. Without this powerful tool, U.S. trade representatives in this or a future administration won't have the authority to negotiate strong new trade agreements to promote America's economic interests with Taiwan or across the globe. Again, I think it was a mistake to allow two crucial job creating programs, GSP and MTB, to have expired, again, now lapsed for almost two years. An action on these key programs is causing American companies and their workers to lose out to foreign competitors. An additional delay will only increase um, uh, this impact. Bottom line is, for, to close out, Americans' trade leadership is at best with a strong economy, one that promotes domestic production, stronger supply chains, one that's ready to conduct tough and fair trade negotiations with key trading partners like Taiwan. Again, Chairman, thanks for leading this uh, hearing today, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brady. So it's our pleasure now to welcome superb witnesses. First, we have Bonnie Glasser, Director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Next, we have Mr. Mark Wu, independent expert and professor of law and faculty director for the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Next is Shauna Bayard Blow, executive director of the Solidarity Center. And finally, we have Mr. Russell Bain, president of the Texas Farm Bureau. All of your statements will be made part of the record in their entirety. And I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you with that time, please keep an eye on the timer that is in front of you. I will notify you when time has expired. Ms. Glasser, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on issues pertaining to the U.S.-Taiwan trade relationship. My testimony will make the case for a comprehensive U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement, a BTA, based primarily on geopolitical factors and I will leave it to other witnesses to evaluate the potential economic benefits and impacts. There are five reasons why the United States should sign a BTA with Taiwan. First, Taiwan is a robust and vibrant democracy that is a trusted partner of the United States. The first half of the 21st century will be defined by a systemic competition between the capitalist democracy championed by the United States and its allies and the authoritarian state-led economy advanced by the People's Republic of China and other countries aligned with it. Taiwan is at the front line of this rivalry as Beijing intensifies political, military, and economic coercion against it as part of a broader strategy to subvert the island's democracy and compel reunification. The United States should aid Taiwan's efforts to defend its people, its democracy, and its freedoms. A U.S.-Taiwan BTA would serve that goal. It would demonstrate American solidarity with Taiwan's people and reward their success in cultivating strong democratic institutions, robust civil society, transparent and accountable government, and economic freedoms. Second, in addition to strengthening Taiwan's military security through arms sales, the U.S. should seek to strengthen Taiwan's psychological security by increasing the confidence of Taiwan's public in U.S. support for Taiwan's prosperity. The best way to do that is by modernizing the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship, helping Taiwan diversify its trade ties, and encouraging other countries to sign trade agreements with Taiwan. These goals can be achieved through the negotiation of a comprehensive U.S.-Taiwan trade agreement. Third, a U.S.-Taiwan trade deal could be the only avenue for Taiwan to join the process of competitive trade liberalization in Asia. Taiwan has largely been sidelines from the trends of increasing regional economic integration and connectivity. Not only has this been detrimental to Taiwan economically, it's also led to greater isolation of the island, which serves Beijing's interest in lowering the morale of Taiwan's people and reducing their confidence in their elected government. A U.S.-Taiwan BTA could also provide political cover for other countries to negotiate their own bilateral agreements with Taiwan. Taiwan has sought trade deals with the European Union, Australia, Japan, the United Kingdom, and India, but its efforts have been stymied by Beijing. 
Fourth, the BTA with Taiwan would boost confidence throughout the Indo-Pacific in American leadership and its ability to be a significant player in the region's economic affairs. U.S. allies and partners in the region welcome American military and diplomatic presence, but they view this as insufficient. They seek a United States that is an active and reliable partner in the region's political economy. Taiwan's fate is pivotal to peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. A successful PRC invasion of Taiwan would shatter regional confidence in U.S. security guarantees and weaken the credibility of the network of U.S. alliances. Fifth, the U.S. should reward Taiwan for being a good partner and preserving the cross-strait status quo. Since assuming power, Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen and her government have expressed strong interest in a trade agreement with the United States. And as a trade negotiator by training who led Taiwan's negotiations to join the World Trade Organization, Tsai Ing-wen can be expected to ensure that her government will negotiate in good faith and expeditiously deliver an agreement. A U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement would have geopolitical and geoeconomic significance that goes beyond the economic case for such an agreement. Now is the time to move forward with negotiations aimed at reaching a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Glasser. Let me now recognize Mr. Wu. Would you put your... Sorry. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all here today. Let me start by stating the obvious. Taiwan is a miracle, economically, socially, politically. Taiwan deserves our support not only because it serves America's strategic security and economic interests, but because of what it represents in terms of its values, its ideals, and the fact that it serves as a beacon of hope to societies worldwide seeking to free themselves of the yoke of dictatorship and poverty. But it is a miracle that is under threat. Not only security threats, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, but also economic coercion, and finally, and I think what's most relevant for this hearing today, the threat of benign neglect by its ardent, like-minded allies. Over the past decade, throughout the world, but particularly in Asia, countries have been engaged in a series of trade agreements that have engaged in intertwining high-tech economies together, and Taiwan has been left on the sidelines. Taiwan has not signed a major trade agreement since 2013, it has not signed any major trade agreement with any advanced economy other than the small economies of New Zealand and Singapore. In short, American leadership is required, not only because it serves our defense, our farm, our workers' interests, but because we need to send a signal to the world that it is okay to do trade agreements with Taiwan, and more importantly, it is what is expected of those of us in this alliance to push back against state authoritarianism, against state-led uh, capitalism, and against the type of authoritarian surveillance societies that other economies seek to use their influence to push against. Now, as tempting as it may be to use our simple template that we've used for trade agreements in Asia with South Korea, with Australia, and others, the main point that I want to make today is while we think about these security prerogatives, we also need to bear in mind that this is a time in this country when we are rethinking what types of trade agreements are needed to serve American workers, Americans across all segments of our society, across all states. And we need not lose sight of that second point in the haste to conclude a trade agreement with Taiwan. In fact, we need to move in tandem on these two points. There are three points in my testimony that I want to draw to your attention as to why that's the case. First, traditionally trade agreements have focused on market access. But our most competitive exports, by and large, more than, half, more than half of them already have tariffs below one third. Close to half have faced zero tariffs. There are tariff peaks, as we'll hear about, in agriculture and automotive industries. But tariffs, where we focus traditionally, is not where the action is at. It's really about regulations, IP, currency, and these other issues that I know this committee has, in its oversight capacity, focused on very deeply. 
The second point, though, is that Taiwan's economy, because it has been so isolated and because of political choices made by past governments, is deeply intertwined with that of the People's Republic. It's tried to shift this away, but the PRC is the largest source of imports into Taiwan. There are massive investments by Taiwanese firms in the PRC. Over 200,000 Taiwanese citizens work on the mainland. And so if we simply did a cut and paste, it would create threats for backdoor entry for PRC firms into the American market that we do not wish to seek. And then the third point that I want to make sure everyone here leaves familiar with is the concept of ECFA. This is a trade framework agreement that Taiwan previous representatives concluded with the PRC. Now, it's stagnated, but it's still in effect. And so it creates a possibility of a reversal of course in the future with cross straits relations. And we need to bear that in mind. What does this mean? I highlight several points in my policy, but I just want to stress that it means that we need to think about this on a comprehensive manner, not just with trade, but with other elements, investment screening, coordination on high-tech sectors, digital economy, and the like. It also means we need to be focused on regulatory issues, on uh, seizing opportunities, as we'll care about in a moment, to forge high standards in labor, green economy, uh, environmental protections, uh, and against economic espionage. And finally, it means that we need to move quickly, we need to move strategically, we need to make sure that these tricky issues don't bog us down. And if we are to move towards a comprehensive trade agreement, we need to be focused on tight rules of origin and ensuring that there are escape hatches should cross-strait policies change in a future administration in Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Ms. Bader Blau, would you please proceed? Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Solidarity Center's perspective on labor rights in Taiwan. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Solidarity Center. We're a global worker rights organization supporting the advancement of rights and democracy for workers worldwide. I'd like to emphasize five points. First, we come to this hearing with full support for Taiwan's democratic trajectory also in full awareness that trade unions have been dismantled as part of recent crackdowns in nearby Hong Kong. This terrible attack on people's basic rights to form and join unions in Hong Kong underscores the clear priority to support the labor movement in Taiwan. Independent trade unions are essential to sustainable democracy, and now more than ever, it is critical that we support labor rights and unions in Taiwan and open the door to democratic freedoms that workers in Taiwan and around the world have a right to exercise. Second, as Taiwan has commendably built its democratic institutions out of the ashes of dictatorship and martial law, it, it does risk losing and leaving workers behind. It's a missing piece in Taiwan's democratic trajectory. Labor laws violate international standards and practices. The voice of workers on the job and policy making is sidelined, and their bargaining power is greatly diminished. This includes restrictions on the right to freedom of association and to strike, long, extraordinarily long working hours, other health and safety concerns, anti-unionism, and limits on bargaining. Third. Taiwan's economy also depends on more than 700,000 migrant workers, yet they experience particular injustice, including gender-based violence, discrimination, labor exploitation, and even forced labor in domestic work and export sectors like seafood and semiconductors. Finally, Taiwan is a driving force in global supply chains, but Taiwan-based manufacturers too often violate national and international labor standards in their factories across the globe, Despite documented labor rights violations in these companies, though, they have also shown a willingness to participate in new models to address labor rights concerns. We have included examples of Taiwanese companies in our written testimony that are experimenting with important higher road models, negotiating binding agreements with unions to address gender equity, wages, and working conditions, and represent a different model going forward that would have an enormous impact on workers' rights across their supply chains if emulated. 
We know that Congress convenes this hearing today in full support of Taiwan. And we really believe that this support, when put in a trade context, needs to focus also on advancing worker rights in order to build just and fair economies for workers on either side of any deal. Just yesterday, I spoke with platform delivery workers in Taiwan who work for companies like Uber and Food Panda, who say what they really need is a national law that recognizes their rights as workers as any other workers. And yet there is no clear path to achieve this. We talked to airline pilots who described how the application of pandemic quarantine rules keep them from seeing their families for weeks, but who cannot get their employers to bargain over compensation. And we spoke to activists working to protect domestic workers and migrant worker populations in factories and in deep water fishing. Workers, Taiwan's own national ombuds and human rights institutions have said should be covered by labor rights protections, and yet we still don't have a commitment there. As I have spoken with trade unionists and labor activists in Taiwan in recent days, I've been reminded that decent work and shared prosperity don't come about magically through trade or anything else. Workers' rights, bargaining, voice, and impact on policy is what we need to make this happen. If Congress wants workers to support expanded trade between the U.S. and Taiwan, they'll come along, but workers in both places need to see that they will actually benefit, and that it's not just about big corporations and multinationals making a ton of money. And this is even bigger than Taiwan. Taiwanese global corporations can impact whether workers in many more countries have safe, decent work, jobs, and democracy. This is another clear opportunity for Taiwan and the U.S to support high road economic development inside Taiwan that helps workers and unions achieve the promises of democracy, human rights, and shared prosperity, and how Taiwan's powerful companies can also build and sustain those same kind of models wherever they operate. Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking uh, Member Brady, and the members of this committee for bringing attention to these opportunity, this opportunity and these important issues. Thank you again for uh, allowing us to testify to workers' rights in Taiwan today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bader Blau. Uh, Mr. Boehning, please proceed. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, I do appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. My family and I live near Poth, Texas, which is just south of San Antonio, where we make our living farming and ranching. I also serve as president of the Texas Farm Bureau, the largest general farm organization in the state of Texas. I serve on the American Farm Bureau Federation's board of directors as well. Trade is critically important to the current security and future prosperity of U.S. farmers and ranchers. We depend on growing and stable export markets to be profitable and meet the needs of consumers both here in this country and across the world. Engagement in Taiwan and the entire Indo-Pacific region is cr critical for the continued growth of U.S. agricultural exports and the sustained economic health of Americans' farmers and ranchers. In fiscal 2021, the U.S. Ex exported over $3.9 billion worth of ag products to Taiwan. They're our sixth largest agricultural export market during that time. Leading those exports included soybeans, beef, wheat, poultry, and fresh fruit. Ag imports from Taiwan during that same period totaled about $540 million. Texas Farm Bureau continues to monitor the administration's proposed U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade. We appreciate the formulation of ideas to strengthen our trade relationship, but this initiative falls short of being a robust trade agreement. Texas Farm Bureau urges the administration to address existing barriers and enforce a modernized trade agreement with Taiwan. It's important to address the existing 15% import tariff on ag imports and eliminate other obstacles. Non-tariff barriers for exporting U.S. beef and Beef and pork to Taiwan should be also eliminated. For instance, Taiwan's existing zero tolerance policy for rectopamine is not backed by sound science. Although rectopamine's use in the U.S. by beef and pork producers is not widespread, it is an option that is safe, acceptable, and approved by the FDA. We should work with Taiwan to reduce these barriers so that we can strengthen our beef and pork export markets into Taiwan. Furthermore, U.S. agriculture competitive is dependent on having a level playing field regarding tariffs, sanitary and phytosanitary measures regarding food safety, technical barriers to trade, and other essential provisions. 
Taiwan should adhere to a science and evidence-based approach to regulatory matters and remove unwarranted restrictions. In addition, at a time when China is dividing the market share across the world, the Asia-Pacific region is looking for ag import opportunities from the U.S. The administration and Congress should take necessary steps that will increase trade with Taiwan and make them less dependent on China. Most importantly, it's critical for the administration to prioritize trade by working toward stronger, comprehensive, and enforceable trade agreements, not only in Taiwan, but across the world. I fear that the administration is currently falling short of prioritizing that international trade. There is enormous potential to reduce trade barriers and strengthen agreements with the countries involved in the Indo-Pacific economic framework, as well as with China and the United Kingdom. However, to do this, we need enforceable trade agreement provisions that can only be achieved through direct negotiations. Ideas and frameworks are always welcome. However, they must be put into action to strengthen international trade and ensure that the U.S. gains market access into other countries. Furthermore, it's critical that we reauthorize Trade Promotion Authority if we want other countries to actually engage in serious negotiations. TPA, in our opinion, is key to finalizing trade agreements that are enforceable and allow us to compete in the global markets. Without continued work to strengthen and create new agreements, the U.S. will only fall behind and our farm and ranch families will suffer the consequences. We depend on importing and exporting goods with other countries for stable commodity markets and to ensure that we can continue to provide food and fiber worldwide. Again, in closing, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to testify before the committee. We'll be glad to try to answer any questions at your at y'all's time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baining. Uh, without objection, each member will be recognized for five minutes to question our witnesses. Consistent with committee practice in these hybrid meetings, we will dispense with the Gibbons rule and we'll go in order of seniority, switching between majority and minority members. I will begin by recognizing myself. We will have a large series of votes at 1.30. And in that light, I would suggest, because members, I think, are in broad agreement with the testimony that has been offered by our witnesses, that uh, we can accomplish the goals of the committee pertaining to. Let me ask Ms. Glaser, Glaser, in light of China's crackdown on political and human rights in Hong Kong, would you give us your support and suggestions for the importance of Taiwan as an ally of the United States? Thank you for the, for the question, Chairman Neal. Uh, I think that Taiwan has, as I said, proven itself to be an extremely important partner of uh, the United States. It is a beacon of democracy. It is the only example of ethnic Chinese who have created a very effective democracy. And the people across the strait who live in the People's Republic of China, I think, watch that very, very closely. The people in Taiwan, I think, have been quite anxious watching what has occurred in Hong Kong um, as the freedoms of the people there um, have been taken away uh, by, uh, by China. So I hope the United States will continue where possible to provide support um, in Hong Kong for the preservation and even reintroduction of the freedoms, especially uh, freedoms in the media and civil society. Uh, because Taiwan closely watches, uh, Taiwan is an indicator of whether the United States would continue to support Taiwan's democracy. And of course, Taiwan's challenges go far beyond Hong Kong's challenges. They are isolated from the international community. They get daily military pressure from China, cyber attacks, disinformation. There is so much that we need to do. And so uh, I strongly agree with you that the, the Taiwan is a, a crucial partner for the United States, not only in the region, but also globally, and very much deserves more American support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glasser. Mr. Wu, in your testimony, you note that efforts to deepen economic ties with Taiwan through trade must be integrated with other instruments of economic statecraft, such as investment screening and restrictions for outflows of critical technologies. Do you want to expand upon that? 
Thank you very much, Chairman Neal. Uh, yes, I, I want to emphasize the importance of thinking of this trade agreement not as a traditional trade agreement. Traditionally, we think about it as creating expanded export market access. That is important, but as I noted in my written testimony, this needs to be a market access plus strategy. And so if we think about what is in America's interest in terms of deepening this economic relationship with Taiwan, it's really about realigning supply chains in Asia. It's about ensuring that this alliance for which Taiwan is a critical part, not just because of semiconductors, but because of other parts of the electronic supply chain, that that flows through friendly countries, that any type of economic coercion is able to be able to be withstood through alternatives. And so in order to do this, I think we need to work together as partners, not just the US and Taiwan, but other like-minded allies in the Indo-Pacific region. We'll need to do so through coordination and export controls on outbound and inbound investment screening, on research and development, on thinking about how do we uh, focus on our industrial policies, making sure that there are alternative supply sources for what's critical to our defense, but also to our cyber and other needs. Um, so. That's why I noted that we should not be thinking about this simply as trade for trade's sake, but really trade uh, across the board with what else we're doing uh, with IPEF and other uh, types of frameworks in the Indo-Pacific. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Let me now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Uh, and thank you, Chairman Neal. Uh, great witnesses today as well. Um, Mr. Wu, thank you for reminding us sort of an issue that we've known now for 20 years, which is uh, as we work around the world to tear down the American need not apply signs in trade, many of the biggest barriers are not at the border in tariffs or quotas, but beyond them, regulatory borders, the non-science uh, barriers, the, the so-called security barriers. Uh, this committee is very aware of that, and that's why, uh, like USMCA, a great deal of effort has been made to, to pull down those, those non-tariff barriers, and, and I think, too, Ms. Bader Blau, uh, as you raise those labor issues, while the USMCA had a historical support, it may not be a model for every country or region. Certainly, when it comes to labor, both labor rights and enforcement, you know that is a model that this committee can use in a bipartisan way on a free trade agreement, perhaps with Taiwan, which we're hopeful. And so, to to Mr. Banning, um, thank you for your leadership on trade. As you know. To your point, it's not enough to buy American, you have to sell American every, every corner of the world. You know, and all we need is a level playing field, the ability to compete, and, and we win. And agriculture is a perfect uh, example uh, of that. Uh, my sense is that there is a great deal of bipartisan uh, momentum because the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement where we work together so closely, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to take that momentum to, to open up new markets for our farmers, our manufacturers, our, our tech workers, and others. So let's look at Taiwan. So we know uh, Taiwan's applied to join the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the comprehensive and progressive agreement there, We're negotiating a free trade agreement with India, has concluded uh, free trade agreements with 10 countries, including China. Um, so my question to you is, if Taiwan were to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, and otherwise increase its network of free trade agreements, what sort of impact does that have on American farmers and ranchers? Is it, there a scenario here where we actually lose our ability to sell into those customers in Taiwan because we're at a serious disadvantage to other competitors? I mean, can we actually take a step backward if we don't engage in an agreement with, with Taiwan? Thank you for, for the question, Congressman Brady. Uh, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're hitting on it uh, very well. I mean, uh, without, without an agreement, uh, they're going to they're gonna look to other suppliers. They're going to look to other sources. And we feel like uh, uh, if we're not in the, you know, if we're not on the field, we're not, if we're not in the, in the game with them, um, it's going to put us at a disadvantage. We'll lose market share. Um, you know, we have to keep moving forward. These, these trade agreements are so important to American agriculture. American agriculture is very productive. I mean, you folks know that very well, uh, but, but ex the export market is just super important. And um, close to 30% of net farm income on most years comes from the, net, from the um, export market. So yes, uh, we, we need to be there, otherwise 
uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be left behind. You know, to counteract and final question to counteract that dynamic, is it enough to just do a, a framework and a dialogue uh, approach, or do we need a real enforceable free trade agreement to be able to ensure we have that level playing field and ensure that we can counter, you know, the dynamic of other countries having an advantage? We we need that enforceable free trade agreement. It. it those things are important because they, uh, they lead to reduced or, or actually eliminate tariffs. Uh, they, they also provide some enforcement mechanisms uh, to, to work through the, the different issues. Uh, that ensures all parties that are, that are agreed to it that, that, that they stick to the terms of the agreement. So no, we need, we need a solid trade agreement. Uh, just the framework uh, yeah. is not gonna work. Final question is, is trade promotion authority, the power for the president to negotiate on our behalf uh, with the Taiwan in the world, uh, is that necessary to show that we're serious about trade with Taiwan and that we have the tools in place to both negotiate and then pass that trade agreement in a timely basis? We definitely believe that the TPA is very necessary. Uh, you know, it, to us, it's a, non, it's a, it's, it's a nonpartisan issue. Doesn't make any difference who the, you know who's in the White House, who the administration is. We we're definitely in favor of it because then the folks that are sitting across the table from us understand that it's. It Can you hit your microphone there, Mr. Vanny? I'm sorry. Cut out for a minute there. I, yeah, back to the TPA. Yeah, your uh, final point is that those we're negotiating know we're serious about it and conclude it. Yes, sir. And conclude. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bainey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brady. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to all of our witnesses. Uh, clearly, we have a shared bipartisan commitment uh, to assisting the people of Taiwan in resisting the same kind of authoritarianism from the PRC we have seen with the placement of Uyghurs in concentration camps and the suppression of any openness uh, within Hong Kong, a tragedy. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have to evaluate each action we take in terms of whether it will provoke the very type of aggression that we're trying to avoid. Uh, I think the one, policy, one China policy that uh, President Nixon established that we have followed is one that recognizes the Chinese claim uh, to Taiwan, but insists that that claim cannot be enforced through violence. And we need to reaffirm that, uh, having learned and hoping that both the PRC and Taiwan have learned lessons from uh, Putin's uh, ill-fated invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I think the very first trade issue that uh, is important, uh, it, perhaps beyond the jurisdiction of this committee, but is the question of weapons and assuring that Taiwan uh, has the ability to have a strong porcupine type self-defense, that it receives uh, weapons that it needs from the United States at the same price and on the same terms as that made available for other Asian allies. Uh, in my area, Austin, Texas, semiconductors are designed, uh, we lead in semiconductor designing, uh, but so much of the manufacturing take, takes place with Taiwan Semiconductor. We're pleased that uh, they are building an important facility in Arizona, but that relationship and, and the uh, entire area of semiconductors remains very important to us. We also have a very active uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese Chamber of Commerce headed by Dr. Schiller Liao, uh, who provides input on the value of strengthening our economic relationship. I think the uh, U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade uh, offers great potential, uh, but only if it uh, engages the Congress uh, in uh, that effort and engages all of the stakeholders, particularly with reference to some of the concerns that Ms. Ba Baker Blau raised concerning uh, labor rights in Taiwan. I'm concerned, uh, as the U.S. Department of Labor has been, about the use of forced labor uh, in the Taiwanese fishing industry. And of course, in any future trade agreements we have, we need to encourage decarbonization of economies. The climate crisis uh, has to be a top issue. Uh, I think uh, that in negotiating a trade agreement with Taiwan or any other country, 
we need to not lose sight of our democracy here and the role that our Constitution and checks and balances put in place to afford our citizens the right to be heard and to engage the Congress uh, in uh, trade agreement negotiation. Uh, we have a good contrast on that between what happened with the failed Trans-Pacific Partnership and the success of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement. Uh, which recognize that trade is more than just how many widgets move back and forth across a border, but what happens to the workers and what happens to the environment. Let me ask you, um, uh, Ms. blaker Bow, a little more about how you feel that the Biden administration could engage workers and other interested parties uh, in negotiations and what role you think that the Congress should be playing in ensuring uh, that these interests are considered in any uh, strengthening that we all want of our economic relationship with Taiwan. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, there's a lot that the administration and the Congress can do to ensure a, that we have a real life worker center trade policy. To date, the administration uh, through the representation in Taiwan has not actively engaged in the context of the 21st century trade deal. Um, discussions, uh, workers and their representatives. We've heard, in fact, from them that they have tried to engage and been rebuffed, so there's a lot of work that can be done there. Congress can ensure that that happens by uh, making sure that uh, the administration is, in fact, following its own guidelines on uh, consulting workers in trade. I believe that there's an enormous opportunity to uh, work directly with stakeholders and workers in both um, Taiwan and the United States to ensure that workers directly benefit from this trade deal. I think USMCA has some good models there. Um, but most importantly, the workers of Taiwan have democratic institutions. They're small, and they're, the um, economy and the political system has not been advantageous to the growth of unions and collective bargaining. That is a specifically important role that Congress can play in ensuring that happens so that workers really do share in the prosperity that comes through uh, trade. Thank you. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Uh, I had a, a rare opportunity in the 80s as a business guy with a lot of other CEOs from around the world in Hong Kong and Beijing. And I spent 10 days there with a lot of those business people. And, and I agree with Mr. Wu, the sense of wh where, it's, where it was then and where it's come is an economic miracle. Uh, there's no question about it. Because at one side of it, you've seen Beijing. They, it was just 10, I just remember, like 10 million bikes in the street. And then you go to Hong Kong with a different system, free markets and free enterprise. And they, they were doing very well, even many of the workers and everybody else. So I just want to say that up front. And then obviously I had a chance on a Codell to go with uh, Paul Ryan. We visited five or six countries in that region. Uh, we were focused on trying to get something done, but every prime minister or president of those countries wanted us more engaged and more engaged now, and that was back many years ago. So I want to mention that. Uh, Mr. Bain, let me ask you uh, just real quickly, in terms of the agricultural industry, it's huge in Florida. Uh, but I want to get your sense of where it's been, where we're at now, what your expectation is, is in terms of Taiwan uh, exporting more, uh, not just pork and beef, but just everything else too, ideally. So your question, uh, Mr. Congressman, was where are we right now with Taiwan? Yeah, where, where do you sense of kind of where we've we been? Are we, do we have some momentum, uh, yeah, potential in terms of uh, the future going forward, in your opinion? I, I believe we do. Uh, uh, Taiwan's, I mentioned in my testimony, there are six, you know, our sixth largest uh, export market when it comes to ag products. Um, their economy is growing. Their middle class is growing. Uh, you know, Mr. Wu pointed out very, very well uh, how, how that country has just, just really moved forward. Um, and we think, we think this, really the sky's the limit there. And uh, there, should, there is some momentum, momentum, uh, but it's time to really sit down at the table and, and have some serious I negotiation. I know a lot of the folk focus is on beef and pork. Uh, what's your thought as it relates to that? Well, th yes, and, and I, I guess that's kind of, that's the consumer, the direct consumer goods, but uh, there's other ag products as well. Uh, we have soybeans, we have fresh fruit, 
uh, things like that. I'm sure uh, the state of Florida benefits from you know the, some of the fresh fruit that's uh, that's exported there, and of course California as well. And uh, we grow a little bit in Texas as well. Yeah, so thank, uh, thank you. Let me. Get, I just want Mr. Thank Rube, you. I wanted to talk to you. I, as I said earlier, it's been an economic miracle. Uh, there's no question about it. Watch what happened in Hong Kong. But I also watched that transition in Hong Kong where everybody's moving to Vancouver. So they moved their families there back in the 2000 or so. So, but you said that your th your point was is that we need to get a free trade agreement and do it ideally quickly. What does that mean to you? Thank you very much. Uh, I think your point is exactly right, right? Taiwan, in terms of its size compared to the PRC or even India or even in Vietnam, right? Those aren't its comparative advantages. Its comparative advantage is its talent and its democratic society that engenders trust. And Taiwan faces a threat today, but it needs to convince that talent and that society, right, to stay there, to push back against that. And we need that from our own economic security interests. I know that, for that some to stay of the trade place, agreements right? we've done is given a lot of these countries the credibility and the esteem to be able to do more business, uh, you know, obviously with the U.S. and other places. What, what's your sense from that standpoint? I know we did one with Korea and Colombia and uh, Panama at the time. We did the U.S. Uh, the trade agreement with uh, Mexico and Canada, but what difference would that make in, from your standpoint, from terms of credibility, in terms of engaging other countries? I think it would spur uh, other countries, but particularly our like-minded allies, Australia, Japan, United Kingdom, the European Union and others to step up their engagement. And we need to do that collectively because when we look at high-tech supply chains, none of us can do it alone. We need to be doing this in an integrated fashion and we need to be tying Taiwan into that rather than cutting it out. And just one other quick thing on chips. As someone mentioned it a little bit earlier, but they say that 95% of the chips that a lot of them come out of uh, Taiwan in terms of the high quality or the state-of-the-art chips, is that, my, is that your sense of it? Yes, I think uh, at the seven nanometer level, uh, at the high end design, right, TSMC, uh, the major Taiwanese uh, semiconductor foundry, has really been pushing the edge. And it's been doing so in partnership, not alone, but in partnership with American design firms, with firms from the Netherlands, uh, with South Korea, Japan, and so forth. And we need to be locking that in through some form of. Thank it. you. Thank you, Mr. Back. Buchanan. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to inquire. Chairman Neal, thank you very much for convening today's hearing, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses for being here. I don't believe this hearing could be more timely as we look for ways to strengthen our relationships with democratic allies ar around the world. And as we all know, strong allies help preserve yep. peace and deter foreign uh, aggression. The Biden administration and Congress, on a bipartisan basis, support a strengthened relationship with Taiwan. And expanding opportunities with Taiwan will bring benefits to our agricultural producers while strengthening environmental, labor, and intellectual property rights protection. Taiwan continues to be a strong and growing market for U.S. agriculture in regard to my district. Uh, wine is a large uh, part of that U.S. market. And uh, Taiwan is the sixth largest Asian market in uh, Taiwan in 2021 imported uh, $264 million uh, worth of uh, wine. And they also are big importers of almonds and walnuts that are grown in my district. So uh, strength in trade in other sectors will benefit agricultural trade, uh, which is important not only to my district, but to districts of uh, many of my uh, colleagues. And uh, given the importance of strong agricultural, uh, strong trade relationships with Taiwan and other Asian markets. I look forward to our committee and the Biden administration working together to resolve issues where they exist and seek opportunities to deepen our economic trade relationships. Uh, Mr. Wu, you note in your testimony that more work is needed to address non-tariff agricultural trade barriers. Uh, can you talk? Uh, uh, can, can, you, can you talk about how movement on non-tariff trade barriers by Taiwan could open up the door to strengthen more uh, consistent uh, agricultural sales in Taiwan? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, 
Mr. Baining has already alluded to some of this, right, but particularly on beef and pork products, particularly with regards to rectopamine. But I think beyond this, um, for what I expect your constituencies, many of them will be focused on, is just ensuring that Taiwan's food safety standards are focused on risk-based, science-based approach, right? Uh, in many instances, American farmers can compete with a level playing field when it's in line with Codex Alimentarius, right? We want to make sure that that's the case. And let me emphasize one other thing, which is the future of American farming is going to be moving towards biotech, and we need to make sure that those types of standards, those regulatory approval processes are aligned uh, on that front, and that doesn't become a protectionist barrier. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Banning, um, can you talk about how a deal to reduce tariffs and address non-tariff trade barriers with Taiwan aids our negotiation with other countries on those same or similar issues? Well, yes, sir. Thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I think it, it it sets an example. It's it's the things. It's 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 like when we you know with the U.S. I'll go back to the USMCA, which we think was a gr great agreement. Uh, it set the standard, and uh, uh, when folks see that. Um, we're making those agreements, and and that everybody is is adhering to them, and following the letter of the law, so to speak. I, I think it just brings more folks to the table, and it enables us to have more more of those free trade agreements. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Baderblau. Can you talk a little more about how the further protection of labor protections in Taiwan serve U.S. interests, and how they help contrast labor conditions by other countries in the region? Uh, uh, briefly, um, American workers should not be competing with forced labor uh, conditions in other countries, so the elimination of forced labor in Taiwan is in the interests of human rights of the people of Taiwan and the migrant workers of Taiwan and also in America's interests broadly. Um, I would also say it's very important that um, free, uh, any, any expanded trade lead to shared prosperity in, in Taiwan. We have enormous inequality and a lack of uh, voice and, and access to policymakers and in, in, uh, influence and impact on labor standards in the country from their civil society due to uh, some restrictions on the rights to, to organize and bargain that can be and should be eliminated. Uh, and I think um, it's extremely important that we use any opportunity when we're talking about expanded trade to directly attack these shortcomings. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly thank you to our witnesses here today. It's good to have you here, uh, Mr. Baining. Thank you for your advocacy for agriculture, especially in the context of trade and how uh, it's important that uh, we look for opportunities to help feed the world and uh, hopefully benefit uh, financially and economically here at home as well. Uh, this hearing on Taiwan and our future trade relationship shows us exactly why it is important to have a proactive and cogent trade agenda, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Taiwan's top trading partner is not the U.S., but China. I'm pleased that, China, that Taiwan is eager to strengthen ties with us and our Main Street values. The appetite is there, and it's not just Taiwan seeking American economic diplomacy and American goods and services. Others around the world are looking for U.S. economic leadership in the face of regional bullies like China and Russia. Done right, this could be a win for American businesses and consumers and a win for democracy. But American exports must be treated fairly, including agriculture, and we need the tools to get us across the finish line, including trade promotion authority that was mentioned earlier. My first question, uh, Ms. Glazer, can you discuss how the U.S.-Taiwan initiative on 21st century trade will increase market access for American exports into Taiwan? I encourage the administration to consider including Taiwan in IPEF, but of course it did not. There are some pros and cons to this choice. Inclu inclusion in a larger block could help further integrate Taiwan into regional supply chains, but there are also opportunities in a bilateral agreement to achieve a higher level of ambition in some areas. How do you evaluate the implications of Taiwan being a part of IPEF uh, versus a partner in a separated bilateral initiative as well? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I share your view that there were some trade-offs here. I think that uh, if we had included Taiwan as an initial member in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, we probably would have lost some other countries 
who felt that excluding both China um, and Taiwan, uh, when including Taiwan, would have been uh, seen as uh, destabilizing and potentially provoke Beijing. And as you know, there are smaller neighbors in the region who are very concerned about that, particularly in Southeast Asia. So I'm of the view that this new 21st century trade initiative with Taiwan can be used to perhaps even make progress even more quickly with Taiwan than in the IPEF framework. And as we make progress with Taiwan, that other countries, uh, trading partners in the region, will see the benefits of, of eventually including Taiwan. In the meantime, we could negotiate uh, what we would see as uh, the building blocks or chapters of an eventual free trade agreement with Taiwan. So this is the first time we have USTR leading trade negotiations with Taiwan in a long time. Under the Trump administration, the State Department initiated an economic prosperity partnership dialogue. That was a good start. but. At, as to your question on market access, my understanding is that market access is not currently included. There is a trade facilitation component, but not market access. I, I appreciate that. I, I think market access uh, certainly needs to be part of our objectives, especially relating to trade. It's hard to imagine a trade agreement really without market access. Uh, so I, can you also discuss the value of our, our showing leadership in the region by signing a trade agreement with Taiwan and, and perhaps how that might provide the necessary cover for other countries to do the same? Yes, thank you, Congressman, uh, giving, for giving me an opportunity to reiterate this point because I think it's crucial. There are many other countries in the region who have even more at stake in their trade with Taiwan than we have. Uh, and Australia had agreed to negotiate a trade agreement with Taiwan, but their relationship with China has become so troubled that they've sort of put it on the shelf. Uh, Japan has enormous amount of trade with Taiwan and sees Taiwan's security as existential. They have now resolved their agricultural problems because Taiwan had been blocking the import of the agricultural products from Fukushima and several of the other provinces after the nuclear accident. And that issue has now been resolved. So by removing that hurdle could open up opportunities. But in the absence of the United States going first, I think these countries are unlikely to to move forward with Taiwan. I think that they would rather see the United States set the example and then, as you say, have us p provide political cover and then move forward with Taiwan. Thank you very much. I, I think it's important to note, you know, there are a lot of moving parts here, but when we can lean in, uh, especially in a bipartisan fashion, I think we uh, see some great potential. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting this timely and important meeting. Let me cut right to the chase. The Biden administration has brought about historic achievements for labor under the Rapid Response Mechanism, a provision this committee helped develop in the USMCA. Uh, Ms. Bader Blau, uh, in your testimony, you argued that the committee must prioritize uh, labor rights for workers in Taiwan. My question is, how could we most effectively apply a provision like the rapid response mechanism to Taiwan to protect labor rights? Thank you for the question. The rapid response mechanism under USMCA in Mexico has led to historic achievements. Uh, workers um, have immediate redress for abuse that ha didn't exist under previous uh, trade agreements. Um, we have seen the rapid response mechanism in Mexico be used effectively to benefit uh, fundamental uh, worker rights, like the right to organize and, and bargain in ways that have led to the, the most dramatic and most exciting late new labor organizing anywhere in the global economy at the moment. So um, that kind of mechanism, immediate redress, recognition of fundamental rights at work, tied to trade law and immediately enforced, uh, is hugely important and uh, sets a new floor. Thank you. Uh, along those uh, same lines, the USMCA contains the most comprehensive set of environmental provisions of any U.S. Uh, trade agreement. Mr. Wu, in your written testimony, you mentioned how deepening bilateral trade ties with Taiwan could present a template uh, for future global cooperation and other priorities such as the environment. What would be the priorities for environmental protection in the trade deal with tai Taiwan and how 
could we build on the environmental provisions in the USMCA to protect those environmental priorities? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I think USMCA is certainly an achievement in terms of setting a cutting edge environmental protection, but I think there's more work to be done. Um, I think Taiwan, as has been pointed out, just like in labor, has also been a node for traffic in certain endangered species. The Thai administration is certainly wanting to show leadership on that front. I think it's a chance to sort of lock in high standards there that weren't necessarily achieved in other agreements like the CPTPP and really sort of then port that into IPEF and have that uh, be an opportunity. So same thing here on climate change initiatives, on building a green economy, but also in standard setting, that's gonna be really important when we look at uh, renewable technologies and so forth. And so I think having the US and Taiwan have a framework to work together closely on that is gonna have gains and ripple effects in supply chains throughout the region. Thank what you. What would be your top priority of those? My top priority would be on coordination on the key renewable technologies, including the types of inputs and on standard setting there, right? If we look at that, China by itself has a gravitational pull because of the size of its market, because of its control over upstream critical inputs. Um, the region needs to work together with Taiwan to make all that happen. Thank you. Ms. Glasser, uh, how can the committee best balance expanding our economic ties with tai Taiwan, which would clearly help their economy uh, while also making sure that uh, here at home we're investing in our own domestic high-tech manufacturing, including in semiconductor chips. Well, thank you, Congressman. Your question is a little bit outside <clears throat> my wheelhouse and perhaps other witnesses will have a better response than I have, but I believe that uh, the Biden administration has uh, made it a priority uh, to invest in America. I think the recent CHIPS Act is really an example of that, and Congress has played such a crucial role in getting that across the finish line uh, and so that we can compete in, uh, in this area where other countries have moved uh, so far ahead and U.S. companies have really fallen behind. So I think we could, should consider other areas where we can add and we can support investment uh, in America and ensure that we are competing effectively with China. We need to, as, as Biden administration officials have said, invest in America and align with our allies and partners in order to, uh, to more effectively compete. So I think there are some things we've already done and there's more that we can do. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I think that uh, since World War II, the United States has accepted trade agreements that favored the other side, that disfavored American workers, because after World War II, we were the last one standing, and we were trying to lift up the rest of the world. But here we sit 80 years later, and, and those trade agreements or the vestiges thereof remain. And it's one of the reasons why American workers uh, have lost so many jobs through the decades is because we've sat here and allowed these imbalanced trade agreements to continue. Uh, I can understand that with third world economies, but not with places like Taiwan. Uh, Mr. Boehnig, you mentioned that their agricultural import duties are 15 percent. What's the duties uh, that America places on Taiwan's exports? Do you know that? Thank you, Congressman. I, I don't know for sure. We, we talked about that a little bit this morning in prep, but I, I think it's pretty much, it's it's pretty much zero. It's generally 5 percent. Yeah, yeah, I think 5 percent or less. Yeah. And, and, and also on industrial, our import duties are far less than theirs. And why would we, why we would accept that as their second biggest trading partner is beyond uh, my comprehension. I think that, you know, behind the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the biggest success of the Trump administration was rebalancing trade to favor or at least get it closer to an equal footing for American workers. I think American workers can compete with anybody on a level playing field, but Washington has placed the American worker behind the eight ball except in these imbalanced trade agreements. So I think everybody I hear on the panel here thinks we need a bilateral tra trade agreement with Taiwan. I think everybody on that panel says, uh, on the witness panel, the possible exception of Mrs. Bader, I didn't hear her say it as clearly. Do you think we need a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan? My organization doesn't take positions on okay. individual right. agreements. Right. Okay. So three out of four clearly said we need a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan. 
You know, the, the average Taiwanese salary is $55,000. It's really not much less than the American worker. I don't know why the American worker would be disfavored in any such modernized trade agreement. So on the one hand, I think we should press this very hard. On the other hand, I don't trust the Biden administration to be able to negotiate a, a favorable trade agreement. Uh, I think that they have an astounding record of failure in the economy and inflate, inflation and fuel cost in foreign policy and so on and so on and so on. So I'm a little torn in, uh, in that regard. I do absolutely believe we need a new trade agreement. Mrs. Glazer, do you think, I, I, I don't know of a single bilateral tri trade agreement that the Biden administration has has entered or really is even seriously negotiating here. We sit two years into uh, into their uh, uh, office. Do you know of any bilateral trade agreement that, I mean, are, 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 are they doing enough to press a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan? Let me put it that way. Are they doing enough? And the answer to your first first question, I will pass that to uh, to Mr. Wu on, on our current negotiations, but are they doing enough for yeah, the tra yeah. are trade they, agreement are, with Taiwan? Yeah. I support the fact that they have created something as an alternative to IPEF, so this is the for 21st century trade um, is that a yes? negotiations. Is that a yes or a no? But it is still not a bilateral free trade agreement. So Mr. in my Wu? view, I'd like to see them do more. Mr. Wu, are they doing enough to, to uh, move toward a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan? Are they taking aggressive action to enter a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan? I think they're taking actions. I think the proof is going to come in the pudding in the next six months because once we enter 2023, right, Taiwan's going to be in an election season. So we've, my point in my testimony was- When, when, when did this start? When Nancy Pelosi landed the plane in Taiwan? Is that when they started the negotiation? Uh, no, the uh, trade and investment framework agreement, which had been stagnant for some time, restarted last June, June 2021. And so okay. that's been part of a, ongoing discussion with Taiwan in this administration. Mr. Mr. I'm going to skip you, Mrs. Bader, because you're ambivalent. Mrs. Mr. Baining, are they doing enough to, are they aggressively pursuing a trade agreement with Taiwan? Now we get to the tough questions, right? Yeah. Um, I, I kind of agree with Mr. Wu. They, they've taken initiative. Uh, I guess the short answer is we want them to do more. Okay. Uh, we, we, I mean, so uh, coming from an organization, from an ag perspective, uh, we think the potential is there uh, to do more. Uh, uh, so th th they've started the initiative, but, but we need to work on it harder. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Banning. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I really appreciate having this hearing, the witnesses. I mean, it, it's hard to think of a more consequential time for us to think through this relationship with Taiwan. We've seen so many events of late that have focused that attention, whether you're talking about Ukraine, uh, activities, the, the speaker helped maybe focus some of this. Um, Ms. Glazer, you, you talked about the delicate balancing act that everybody in the theater is involved with. Um, the administration is walking a tightrope, trying to deal with security issues, protecting Taiwan, not provoking uh, China unduly. You, uh, our friend Mr. Smith pointed out that the trading relationship between Taiwan and China is critical. I mean, this is the largest source of uh, economic activity with Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is the world's source for the very high-end, sophisticated chips that we all rely upon. And I'm pleased that we got our chips legislation moving, that there's going to be more investment, more attention was given, not just to the really high-end, but maybe some of the legacy chips that allow us to have pickup trucks and microwaves. Um, but it is, uh, I think it's, it's something that we need uh, to be focusing on broad areas of agreement. I think there, this is an opportunity for this committee to come together. Uh, some of the things that have hung us up on GSP or MTB, it, looking in the context of the, Chi of the Taiwanese relationship, I think there's an opportunity for us to, to come together. Um, I am uh, encouraged um, that we're not sweeping things under the rug. 
Taiwan has an egregious record when it comes to the fishing industry. They have what I think is the second largest uh, commercial fleet um, behind the Chinese themselves. Um, if we're not consistent with our friends and allies with Taiwan, how are we going to support the efforts that have been made with the WTO, with, with China, and other outliers? Um, so I'm, I am hopeful that as a result of this hearing, Mr. Chairman, there's a chance that we can focus on areas of agreement, that we can focus on areas of priority, deal with some of the challenges in terms of agricultural act. This is not beyond our capacity. But I think being able to marshal other countries to be part of our efforts in refining this relationship with Taiwan, um, even if it's not as overt as we would like, it's important to send those signals and align their efforts. One of the, I think, sad failures of the last administration was a decision to basically go it alone, that whether it's uh, climate or it's uh, drive-by tariff policies, we weren't coordinating with other, uh, other interests, other countries that share our values and our interests. And I think working with Taiwan to expand that scope would be very, very important. I'm wondering if you, if uh, uh, Ms. Blader Blau, any of the panelists, talk a little bit about this conundrum in terms of what we need to do dealing with the Taiwanese fishing industries. It's very real problems, although we've had some action with the administration. Uh, what's the next step? I think there's an opportunity for Taiwan and the United States to commit to ending forced labor in that sector and to, to commit to that by taking steps that have, in fact, been recommended by Taiwan civil society and also to Taiwan's own national human rights bodies. Extend full labor protections to all workers in that industry, whether they're deep water fishing or, or other f types of fishing. Apply the Labor Standards Act and make sure that they are covered by labor, uh, all the labor laws that, and labor inspection. We need to uh, have joint attention to prosecution of uh, companies and actors, um, labor brokers that engage in human trafficking. These are crimes that are, and employers are getting away with criminal behavior. So we need political will and partnership between the United States and Taiwan to address that once and for all. Mr. Chairman, I think that's an important step forward that we can all agree on that will have residual benefits to being able to strengthen this relationship. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding the hearing and thank the witnesses for being here. There is, there is no question that President Biden's trade moratorium has sidelined American goods and services. The Biden administration has shown zero interest in pursuing bilateral trade agreements, which are vital to U.S. manufacturers, farmers, and, and, and businesses to have a spot in the international marketplace to allow them to compete on the global stage. Meanwhile, we continue to fall behind China while our trade agenda sits stagnant. As my colleagues have mentioned, Taiwan is our eighth largest trading partner, representing over 144 billion in total goods traded in 2021. They are also our 10th largest export market, including nearly 4 billion in U.S. agriculture goods. Recently, Taiwan has taken steps to expand their beef and pork imports, a step that proved to be politically challenging, but there is still progress to be made. Mr. Baining, since Taiwan eased pork and beef restrictions in June of 2021, how has that impacted U.S. markets, and are we seeing an uptick in U.S. beef and pork exports? Thank you for, thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, Yes, uh, and beef and pork in the last couple of years have uh, have gone up tremendously. I have the have the figures somewhere. We don't have them right in front of me, uh, but I know that those are two products that have uh, basically, especially on the beef side, uh, has basically doubled since in the last couple of years. To Taiwan. Yes, sir. To Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Baining. Um, as a cattle farmer myself, I recognize the 
the, the real importance of opening global markets to U.S. beef. And for our ranchers, Taiwan still maintains barriers uh, to some U.S. beef, citing BSE as a concern, even though the World Organization for Animal Health recognizes the risk as negligible. Likewise, Taiwan has banned imports of U.S. ground beef and beef trimmings going against OIE standards. When it comes to any kind of trade negotiations with Taiwan, do you believe there are necessary topics to address and include in any future agreement? Yes, yes, sir, I do. The, th those are some things I kind of alluded to in my testimony. Those are those non-trade uh, barriers that have to be addressed and really can only be addressed through di direct negotiation. Uh, so, so we're looking forward to that because we think that will even open up more uh, export opportunities for our farmers and ranchers. So out of those trade barriers, could you cite to me maybe the top one or two that you think are the most, making the most significant impact uh, for our agriculture goods with Taiwan in trade? Well, probably the, 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 the let's talk about the, the, the tariff first. The 15% tariff is probably one of the best, one of the biggest ones. Uh, Non-trade non barriers, uh, just some of the, the, the I mentioned the ractopamine uh, issue, even though it's not used uh, extensively, uh, it's, it is a trade barrier. So those would be two of the, the ones that we need to look at. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kind, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony today. Very timely, by the way. But let, we should all be very clear here in the committee that our one China policy should not prevent us from uh, intensifying and increasing our cooperation with Taiwan, with trade or otherwise, nor in speaking out against the growing tensions in the region, especially displayed by the PRC uh, in recent months. But Ms. Glazer, Mr. Wu, let me ask you, uh, is there any note of caution that we should be considering? Because I think you know, the consensus, and there's strong bipartisan consensus for us to strengthen trade ties, perhaps move forward with an FTA with Taiwan, but should there be some uh, concern about the reaction from the PRC uh, with that and uh, uh, act as a guide uh, to us? Thank you very much for the question. When it comes to trade agreements, we should keep in mind that Taiwan is, of course, a member of the World Trade Organization. It doesn't use the name Taiwan. It names the territories that it controls, but it has the right to negotiate trade agreements with other members. So I don't see a trade agreement with Taiwan as provocative against China. There are other things perhaps we could debate. Somebody's marking up a bill today uh, regarding uh, Taiwan that perhaps there are some elements that some might see as provocative. I don't believe that trade agreements fall in that category, and I think that we, we tie our hands unnecessarily by being afraid to advance a trade agreement with Taiwan because of a possible uh, backlash from, from China. And I think that, uh, again, if we, if, if we don't move forward, we don't provide the cover and the encouragement to spur other countries yeah. to do the Mr. same. Mr. Wu, you agree generally? I agree. Uh, I agree with Ms. Glazer. And I just want to remind the committee, right, that we would do so under the auspices of our One China policy, under the U.S.-China joint communiques, under the six assurances and so forth. And just as China, the People's Republic, has recognized Taiwan, although under a different name, right, the separate customs territory, um, it's also recognized our ability to do so with Hong Kong. And we do do so with Hong Kong, and that is a part of the territory of mm -hmm. the People's Republic itself. So I don't see how the People's Republic let could. Me, let me just stick with you two real quick. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, given uh, this increased saber rattling by the PRC demonstrated in recent, uh, uh, recent time, is it time for us uh, as a Congress, perhaps working with the administration, to more clearly indicate what the consequences would be if China were to take, if the PRC were to take an adverse action against Taiwan in the form of economic sanctions? Or does the precedent established now with Russia stand for itself and, and, and China knows what our reaction would be? I think what um, Congress needs to do jointly with the executive branch, right, is to think about this across the board, all different forms of economic cooperation, right? We're thinking about what would happen in a blockade, but what would happen with 
increased cyber attacks, what would happen with the choking off critical inputs, and so on and so forth. So we need to have a plan in place on all of these different fronts. A trade agreement, as I responded to the chairman, is just but one piece of that. We need to be looking at investment screening, export controls, control over critical technologies, and that's something that Congress needs to do in conjunction with the administration, just as was done, we saw with the CHIPS Act. Ms. Glazer, do you have any thoughts? I think it's clear that China is paying very close attention to the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia. Um, and it is a big question mark. Would we be willing to freeze the central bank reserves of, of, of China uh, if they invaded Taiwan? Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is look at the playbook that has been used against Russia, see what might be applicable in, in a case of dealing with, with China. And then we have to talk very closely with our partners. I read an article this morning, I think it was in Reuters, that said that we have these conversations underway now with the EU. I think they're at a preliminary stage. But of course, we have to move from the conversation stage to actually the, uh, the, st the stage of agreeing what we can do and signaling China what we are willing to do, because that's part of strengthening deterrence so that China will not move against Taiwan with force. Yeah. Mr. Peter Blau, this may be unfair, but in the 30 seconds you have remaining, uh, what's been ta China, or Taiwan's track record with labor rights as a country? Uh, in general, it um, falls behind international standards. It has a ton of room to improve. There, there are really good labor organizations that with the space could make a huge difference in the country, and I hope these conversations can help shine a light on them and help them advance. You still got eight seconds. You want to expand on that? No, you were, no that was terrific. <laughs> Amazing, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Down Chairman. Uh, <laughs> thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swigert, to inquire. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Wu, um, educate me. Um, trade between Taiwan and PRC. What's the scale? What's the value? Um, you know, help, help me understand first how robust that um, cross-strait trade is. Sure. So um, the PRC is Taiwan's largest source of exports, right? So um, it constitutes 28 percent of Taiwan's total exports. Um, if you include Hong Kong as part of uh, beyond mainland China, that's 42.3 percent. That's okay. a significant I, I don't portion. want to include Hong Kong. Okay. Um, well, without Hong Kong, 28 percent. That's far, as far as exports are concerned. Okay. As far as imports coming into Taiwan, um, the mainland China the PRC, again, is the largest source. It's 21.6%. By contrast, right, the U.S. represents 10%. So you can see here. No, no, you're going the right direction. I was then going to ask also a little category. I'm trying to get my head because I've been looking at some of the tables on what appeared to be items of high tech compared to even, I uh, was surprised seeing some consulting, some financial consult, other categories. I'm trying to get my head around what is products for manufacturing and what are sort of the movement of money and investment. Um, so in terms of uh, movement of, I think we could think about it, movement of capital, movement of knowledge, and movement of technology. Mm -hmm. There are significant investments that Taiwanese firms have made on the mainland itself. The best example would be a company like Foxconn, right, Hong Hai, um, that manufactures iPhones and so forth as part of a global supply chain in mainland China itself, right? TSMC has a plant in Nanjing, just as it's building out one in your home state, right? Um, and so uh, there are significant investments. There's over 200,000 Taiwanese that work on the mainland. Um, and so that's why I said you, we really have to keep these in mind as we think about this can't just be a cookie cutter trade agreement. It, you actually beat me to the complexity that keeps going through my mind. The other portion is um, transshipment, actually made in PRC, comes to Taiwan, has a value added, and then somehow is labeled. Um, what do you believe is um, indication of that, scale of that? So this is quite difficult to say because obviously many goods leave the PRC itself or transship through Hong Kong and so on and so forth. And much of the Taiwanese investment on the mainland is for uh, the mainland Chinese market as well as the rest of Asia. But to my point, right, it is a real threat and that's why we need to have really strong rules of origin that go well beyond anything we've ever seen to cut off the possibility of that type of transshipment. But if we look at 
industries like steel, uh, textiles, and so forth, where there are major issues of transshipment, oftentimes PRC firms have found it easier to invest in countries in Southeast Asia that are more open to PRC investment than Taiwan itself and use those as destinations of transshipment. Okay. Um, help me on a little bit of Taiwanese tax policy, um, uh, VAT, their VAT tax model. Um, do you know what the percentage is, and do they have different categories? I don't. I can get back to you on that, but I don't have the information readily at hand. Okay, so the whole discussion I was about to have with you on the refundability of their export on their VAT is we're not going to have. Oh, so I'm, I'm, so I as far as trade policy is concerned, right, certainly VAT policy is used as an element of industrial policy. That I am familiar with, right, that, that can be used. And as I noted in my testimony, that's not the only tool of industrial policy. Currency interventions by the central bank is another tool there as well. Um, and that's why I said all these things, right, which uh, oftentimes the Treasury Department rather than USTR is taking the lead, we really can't think of these as separate discussions. These need to be done in parallel track with one another. When you've looked at some economic integration, how about um, regulatory sync? Um, you know, standards, uh, I know we've already had multiple discussions of labor standards, but also sort of regulatory standards on use of certain materials, um, those. How difficult do you think that would be in putting into an agreement? I think it really depends on the sector, but I think it's absolutely critical and we need to sort of move sector by sector through those and we just need to convince not only Taiwan but the rest of our allies in the Indo-Pacific region to align on a certain set of joint standards because that regulatory certainty is what's required in many of these firms um, for that investment R&D to take place and that those can take many years and have right, really dynamic uh, effects on the supply chain. All right, now the speed test in the last 10 seconds. I am blessed to have the Taiwan Semiconductor right on the side of my congressional district, but also, you know, the area I live. As a member of Congress, what can I do to be a good host to that community coming in? Um, I think beyond, right, when we were seeing um, immigration policy, making sure knowledge workers can flow in, making sure capital um, is readily available, steady source of water, other types of minerals, critical for semiconductor manufacturing. Thank the That's gentleman. all things Congress can do. Thank you Thank for you. your patience, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal, for holding this important hearing, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for discussing the significance of our current trade relationship with Taiwan. Um, as we heard earlier, Taiwan is the United States' ninth largest trading partner, um, but our nations share much more than just goods and services that we interchange. Our values and our commitments to upholding democracy, combating the climate crisis, and supporting economic growth present some very clear opportunities, in my opinion, to enhance the U.S.-Taiwan trade, um, trade space. Um, this authority ultimately lies with the Congress, and under Chairman Neal's leadership, this committee stands ready to deepen our economic ties to benefit both of our countries. As we approach trade with Taiwan, it's important to also recognize current gaps that leave workers vulnerable to exploitation and abuse in our supply chains. We heard today's witnesses detail the vulnerability workers in Taiwan face. Both domestic and migrant workers have limited opportunities to form democratic unions and collectively bargain, and migrant laborers um, experience wage theft and excessive overtime. Supply chains in Taiwan are critical in producing many of the name brand shoes, clothing, and electronics that Americans enjoy, but this shouldn't come at the expense of the dignity of workers and their rights. The future of U.S.-Taiwan trade is an opportunity to look at our nation's success with USMCA, where Democrats fought for and won new labor protections in a trade agreement. We've seen workers successfully exercise their rights under USMCA. Um, I'd like to ask Ms. Bader Blau, how can our trade agreements support stronger labor standards and enforcement in Taiwan? And how can we extend protections to migrant workers including those in the seafood industry, which is not covered under Taiwan's domestic labor laws? Thank you for the question. I think um, it's uh, critically important that Taiwan reform, uh, uh, work to reform its labor laws. Uh, we lay out some very concrete suggestions about how that could happen. 
um, building on a democratic foundation in the, in the country and a strong civil society that should be possible to do as part of a worker center trade policy um, and engagement. And we would urge Congress to ensure that that happens uh, in any conversation about expanded trade. It's critically important that migrant workers um, achieve actual equal rights to, tai, uh, to tai, Taiwanese workers. Um, they are covered under labor law, but very often those laws are violated. Um, labor, uh, many migrant workers have to actually pay fees to achieve work in Taiwan. They're paying to work, so they show up in debt, debt bondage, um, and those uh, brokerage companies can just be eliminated. And um, I think working together, the United States and uh, Taiwan can definitely achieve high road labor standards and help support workers achieve shared prosperity and really truly uh, democratic rights in the country as workers. So it would be um, Congress's job then to try to craft a trade agreement in which we could see some of those um, standards uh, put into place and some enforcement mechanism for making sure that um, Taiwan abides by those new standards. Yes, and uh, USMCA represents a new floor that can be built on in any, any conversation about expanded trade, particularly in the area of uh, enforcement and rapid response when they're in the cases of, of labor abuse. So we would urge a building on that um, model in any kind of conversation about expanded trade. Um, and just generally for the panel, and raise your hand if you would like to answer, I'm interested in knowing if you think uh, or who would agree that um, when we're looking at democracies around the world with shared values um, as strategic allies, that trade uh, with those allies definitely increases trust and um, commitment to work together in other spaces as well. Does anybody disagree with that statement? No. Great. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony here today. I represent a district that's uh, heavily based on agriculture and manufacturing in Illinois and know the value of a robust trade agenda um, and how that affects our economy, particularly our farmers, our small businesses, uh, and the entire uh, economic apparatus, and particularly in a time that we continue to suffer from reckless spending and growing inflation, finding new markets, new customers, new opportunities is really essential for our U.S. producers uh, and businesses and, and has to be a top priority. But listening to many of my colleagues today, I, I share the frustration with the current Biden administration that we're almost two years into this administration and we don't have a substantive trade policy. And I think that's reflected in what we've heard today as it relates to, to Taiwan and, and really a lack of engagement when it comes to FTAs, market access, uh, TPA, consultation and communication on our priorities with, with Congress. And I, I pulled up this article that I read from July uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And the title is, Biden's Missing Trade Policy. Allies and rivals are striking new deals while the U.S. loses ground. It goes on to say, while Biden dithers on trade, Pacific nations continue to strengthen trade with each other and China. China is stepping in to fill the gap. It goes on at the end to say, Mr. Biden's trade abdication is all the more puzzling given inflation and the risks of recession uh, and, and interest rates that are rising. And, and I, I, I think about that and uh, it seems like the Indo-Pacific region and our allies there are craving U.S. leadership. They want U.S. leadership to step in, to play a role, uh, and, and to be a leader. And, and again, the administration uh, continues to put out contradictory trade policy or messaging and very, very confusing uh, messaging. And so, um, having said that, um, Mr. Wu, I want to ask you a question. Um, if you listen to what Xi Jinping in China says, what do they say? He, he loves to say democracy doesn't work. You can't find consensus, they can't do anything, and, and you have to be more like us. And so th there are economic rival in so many different ways. They have a plan to replace us, right? That's their goal economically. And here we are w without a cohesive trade policy as it relates to China. And so you talked a little bit earlier about uh, a number of our allies and their relationship with Taiwan. Can you talk about the Chinese malign activities as it relates to allies, uh, whether it's the U.S. or others, that try to engage with Taiwan 
and, and the level of extortion, coercion, uh, and, and really, um, you know, coercive uh, activities that China engages in? Uh, certainly, Congressman, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, it, it ranges across the board, right? The, uh, the most overt example was what we saw China did with Lithuania, right? Lithuania looked to deepen its ties with Taiwan. Lithuania, like Taiwan, faces uh, existential threat from an authoritarian neighbor. In the course of doing that, Lithuania is also a member of the EU itself, and China blocked uh, imports of certain goods from Lithuania, but not only that, also European goods with Lithuanian content. Um, it can take other steps, even in cross-straits relations or, or with other allies in the Indo-Pacific. We've seen it just slow down regulatory approval, raise issues about food safety standards, things along those lines. So it can be anything as overt as what we saw with Lithuania, down to anything as subtle as just really slowing down the discretionary authority that the regulatory uh, officials have. And can you talk in general, um, I alluded to the Wall Street Journal, but talk about the lack of U.S. leadership when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region and, and where it goes. So uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, in response to the question, uh, on Taiwan, I think USTR has stepped up in engagement in revitalizing the TIFA, which had been left dormant for quite some time. Um, I think with regards to the other area, right, the administration is taking is with regards to IPEF and corralling other folks together to work on a comprehensive type of approach. What's not been part of the equation has been the market access types of issues um, that I I know that some others here on this panel think is also important as part of a trade agenda. The 21st initiative with Taiwan is a stepping stone to clear the low-hanging fruit on especially the regulatory issues that are, I think, absolutely critical, but also on finding ways to work together on standards and other areas that I think, as I noted, alluded to in my testimony, right, it's not about tariffs for many sectors, although for agriculture it is. I right? absolutely agree with what Mr. Baining highlighted, but it's about coordination on those fronts. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to begin by stating that I strongly believe that it's time for the U.S. to proceed on negotiations toward a free trade agreement with Taiwan. And I'm so thankful for this hearing today for providing our committee an opportunity to examine the benefits that an FTA could deliver to both the U.S. and Taiwan. I was disappointed that the administration did not include Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, but I'm pleased to see the continued engagement from USTR through the U.S.-Taiwan Initiative on the 21st century. Um, but these administration-led initiatives are limited in what they can accomplish, which is why Congress should exercise our constitutional authority to pursue a bilateral FTA with Taiwan, our ninth largest trading partner. And so, uh, Ms. Glazer and Mr. Wu, uh, we know that trade with Taiwan already supports 188,000 jobs in the U.S., and the Taiwanese market is a critical foothold in the region for American goods and services like agriculture, media, technology, and much more. In fact, this afternoon, I am attending a signing ceremony for the Taiwan Agricultural Trade Goodwill Mission Taiwan is already the seventh largest export market for American agricultural products, but today they are signing an agreement intended for Taiwan to purchase more than $3.2 billion worth of American corn, soybean, and wheat in 2023 and 2024. And Taiwan leaders have taken steps to address U.S. concerns that might pose barriers to an FDA, including by working to strengthen protections for intellectual property. A, a free trade agreement would help us unlock even more benefits for both our economies. So, Ms. Glazier and uh, Mr. Wu, can you talk about why this moment is a right time for an FTA with Taiwan beyond the geopolitical reasons? What are some of the ways in which an FTA can benefit each of our economies? Thank you for the question, Congressman Chu. Uh, I believe that we have, as I said earlier, a leader in Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, who is very committed to this bilateral relationship and wants to strengthen it. She has already invested her political capital in lifting uh, many of the restrictions that existed on the use of ractopamine in our beef and pork. They have not been 100% lifted. 
but she did lift them. In fact, there was a referendum that was held in Taiwan which wanted to overturn her lifting of the restrictions and failed. So my point is she has um, a year and a half left in her presidency. We don't know what will come next. My guess is that any leader of Taiwan will have, want to have close relations with the United States. But I think this particular moment is especially important because Taiwan is under the pressure of China increasingly. And with the war going on in Ukraine, there is this growing concern in Ukraine, uh, I mean, sorry, in Taiwan, that the United States, because we didn't put troops on the ground in Ukraine, that maybe we wouldn't come to the rescue of, of, of Taiwan. And there are things that we can do in peacetime to help bolster the confidence of the Taiwanese people. That confidence is extremely important to, to ensuring that Taiwan remains prosperous and secure. Thank you, Congressman Chu. Uh, beyond what Ms. Glazer has already highlighted, uh, in my response to Congressman Schweikert, I, I highlighted Taiwan's interdependence on mainland China. Uh, Taiwan, clearly under this government, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, um, wants to lessen that. Trade agreements, not just with the United States, but also with other like-minded allies, will help to do that, right? The Thai administration has tried to push this go south policy to push trade towards other uh, countries uh, in ASEAN. It's not been able to do so successfully because it doesn't have the pull that's coming from like-minded allies, US, Japan, Australia, and so forth. So I think it'd be critical to do that. I think the other thing that I just want to add, I haven't had a chance to elaborate on, is this is a critical moment because of what's happened in Hong Kong, creates an opening for Taiwan to step up. We are seeing Amazon put cloud services in Taiwan. We're seeing the migration of different types of services because of the lack of trust, right, um, move towards Taiwan. This is a moment for Taiwan to seize on that. We know services industries aren't isolated. They need to be tied to be integrated. Singapore is a shining example of why that's the case. And so it's an opportunity to sort of seize on that for, to create win-win situations for both American and Taiwanese service workers. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Winstrup, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all uh, for being here today. I think you can tell across this committee that there is uh, definitely support for deeper U.S. engagement with our friends in, in Taiwan. Uh, our vib the vibrant democracy, their economy, values, common interests, they're all there, and it's exactly the kind of trading partner that we want to be engaging with. And, and you, I've heard the word trust thrown out here many times today, and that's hugely important when it comes to what we're dealing with today, especially what on the global stage that we have. And I'm glad the administration has begun negotiations with Taiwan on the U.S.-Taiwan uh, initiative on 21st century trade. Um, but I, I'm disappointed the administration not taking full advantage of an opportunity it has to advance U.S. interests in the Indo-Pacific region. And, um, you know, we need to engage with Congress on renewing a trade promotion authority. And, um, you know, we. We really need to advance in that way, in my opinion. Uh, so while we see a lot of promise, uh, the initiatives that we are seeing, they suffer from a fundamental flaw, and that's that Congress has not been formally brought into the process through trade promotion authority, which um, I actually call congressional trade authority as much as anything else. And, and, it's, and it's an opportunity. I don't want to miss this opportunity that we have. And um, I, I want to assure that we aren't missing that opportunity to advance U.S. interests in the, in the region in general and form a lasting, durable, comprehensive way. You know, one of the things that I get very concerned about, and this is, this is a national security concern that we, that we have today. Um, you know, if we can't produce something domestically, especially, then we've got to do it with people that we trust and, and that are allies. And this is the opportunity that we have. You know, but when we look, you know, China doesn't want um, China doesn't want to make Taiwan uh, more like the United States. They want to make it more like China, right? They want to make it more like mainland, mainland China, and and so uh, that's the exact opposite of, of what we want. So their interests in Taiwan are far different from ours. But um, you know, going to the national security interests. Uh, you know, I look at national health security. If, if you'd have told me as a surgeon in Iraq that my protective equipment relied on an adversary, China, and, and my pharmaceuticals relied on China, like, how did we get here? We got a problem here, so we got to start turning this ship around. 
So uh, if you would, Ms. Glazer, anybody who really wants to comment, let's talk about shifting away from uh, critical supply chains from China, Taiwan being a great example. What, what are the benefits, what do you see we can gain in engaging with Taiwan in particular uh, when it comes to our national security and our supply chain? Uh, Congressman, I'd be happy to take a stab yeah. at that and then welcome anyone else on the panel sure. who may wish to add. Um, I think um, the semiconductor chips from TSMC, but also a lot of the high-tech equipment, um, that's absolutely critical for our national security, right? And then uh, Taiwan is a leader when it comes to uh, industrial manufacturing. If we think about particularly, all right, some of the specialized materials, the Internet of Things, right, Taiwan is at the forefront of all that. This is going to be critical. We need to uh, not only just shift the supply chains, we need to be shifting how we think about those services that's aligned with all that. And as I highlighted, right, Hong Kong used to be one place that we used to flow this through. That's no longer within the domain of what many businesses consider to be right, trusted, um, we've got to think about how do we source that in Asia with our friends. And I think a trade agreement, as I answered the chairman, is just but one tool for how we do that. We've got to be thinking about investment, export controls, critical technology controls. It's all part of one large part of the equation that's vital for American security. I appreciate that. You know, we, we want to make sure we dot the I's and cross the T's, right? But. Uh, certainly, let's focus on the things that are going to be most important to us going forward and also most important to us right now. Um, so I, I appreciate that, that input. And anyone else that maybe want to comment? Thank you, Congressman. You know, you mentioned national security, and, you know, those of us in the ag sector believe that food security is national security as well. And, you know, it just makes a whole lot, makes a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, that we have a good trading relationship with a country like Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, that shares our political and economic uh, values and our structure. And uh, they know they can depend on us maybe for, for food, and we can depend on them for some of those chips. So uh, Yeah, it's, it's a good uh, trade because um, nutrition is certainly part of the health equation uh, that we're concerned about. So thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman for claiming Mr. Kelly's time. Uh, <laughs> The gentlelady from Washington State is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for holding this important hearing on the future of the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship. Um, the United States has long recognized that the Indo-Pacific, including Taiwan, is vital to our national security and our economic prosperity. And the region's expected to account for over half of global economic growth in the next 30 years. But many of our allies and partners in the region face real threats. Um, to address these opportunities and challenges, we have to focus on our long-term relationships by bolstering mutual defense relationships, enhancing trade cooperation, collaborating on technology and research, forging more resilient and secure supply chains, and supporting democracies that have been threatened and attacked in recent years. That's why I joined Speaker Pelosi on a recent congressional delegation to the region and to Taiwan. We didn't go to change the status quo. Um, in fact, the Taiwanese people are facing ongoing threats from the People's Republic of China that would trample their vibrant democracy and put them under Beijing's authoritarian rule. The PRC's recent military exercises and trade sanctions against Taiwan following our visit have further validated all of these concerns. So now more than ever, we have to stand arm in arm with the people of Taiwan and our allies and partners across the Indo-Pacific region to continue to show that America's commitment to freedom, democracy, and economic prosperity is unshakable. Uh, Americans have much in common with the people of Taiwan. We both share a commitment to democracy, a desire for peace, an economy that rewards hard work and innovation, a penchant for freedom, and a commitment to civil liberties. Um, for example, Taiwan was the first in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage, um, something we discussed while we were there. And for these reasons and more, we need to aid in Taiwan's defense, support Taiwan's democracy, and provide an alternative to China when it comes to trade, investment, and forging more resilient supply chains. Taiwan is already a top trading partner for the United States with a total trade worth over $100 billion in 2021, supporting over 200,000 American jobs 
Taiwan is the seventh largest export market for Washington state farmers, um, ranchers, and fishers. And one of the major airlines recently inked a deal to buy $4.6 billion worth of American aircraft, replacing an aging European-made fleet. So Taiwanese and American companies also collaborate closely on the production of cutting-edge technologies, like semiconductor computer chips and cloud computing. But our trade relationship with Taiwan could be more robust. Um, and now is the time to seriously consider ways to deepen our trade cooperation for a mutual benefit. And I know the American people agree. The majority of Americans support pursuing a free trade agreement with Taiwan, according to a survey from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We should build on the success of the historic and bipartisan U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement to pursue strong labor and environmental standards with Taiwan, as well as rules to foster sustainable growth in a digital economy. We should create opportunities to promote exports of U.S. services that employ three out of every four workers in my state. We should study both tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade that, if eliminated, would benefit American families and create new opportunities for Washington farmers, farmers across the country, but for Washington farmers in particular to sell apples, wheat, potatoes, and a variety of other high-quality products in Taiwan. And we should explore other opportunities to increase Taiwanese investments in the U.S., such as by reducing double taxation or by taking advantage of the new incentives that we passed in the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act to build semiconductors and climate technologies here in America. The Biden administration's new U.S.-Taiwan initiative for 21st century trade is the right place to start these discussions. I hope the administration follows through on its commitment to achieve meaningful trade outcomes as these talks progress. Um, quickly, I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, Professor Wu, I know you talked about services um, and the regulatory barriers that hurt U.S. service providers. Um, including financial services, telecom, et cetera. I just wondered if you could briefly elaborate on the opportunities that would be there if we more closely integrated our service sectors. Uh, certainly, I think the, in my limited time, right, there's opportunities across a broad range of services, whether we're talking about right, cloud services with Amazon, as I alluded to, but also legal services, accounting services. But more so than anything, it's about making Taiwan a hub for services in Asia. Um, Taiwan tried to embark on this type of strategy, but it put in more barriers, and alternatives like Hong Kong and Singapore have really sort of um, emerged as those service hubs. And with the situation in Hong Kong, this creates a second bite of the apple for Taiwan, and we need to be there to help to support that. And it's, services liberalization can be a part of that uh, strategy. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, your, your background in this is incredible. I, I just know that the business that I've been in my life, you never should rely on one supplier or one buyer because then that entity is going to have control over what it is that you're able to do. And I know we keep talking about strong trade agreements. Uh, is there any reason for us to believe that China will ever uphold its end of the deal on anything? Uh, I think history kind of shows us which way they're going to go, and I think that uh, I'd like to hear from each of you when you talk about a strong trade agreement. I get that, but agreements are only good if both parties are going to be held accountable. Uh, I know we go before the World Trade Organization to get a ruling on things, and oftentimes they come back with a ruling we like, but it's too late. We lose market share. Everything's about market share, and I think that we weaken ourselves by going offshore to do things. So I, I think we've been trying to do things to, to start making things in America again because, I, you know, if we want to be strong, I want to be strong at home. Trade agreements are great, but I got to tell you, I've witnessed too many agreements that were made in the dark, and then uh, by the time daylight comes, it's, they're abandoned. So give, give us an idea of where it is you think we should be. Now, the, the presidents could be able to do some things, but then we're going to have uh, the opportunity to weigh in it also, uh, especially right here in this committee. Uh, but again, but again, if you're relying on one supplier and one buyer, and I don't understand how we think Taiwan is ever going to be safe, and I'd like to know from each of you, and you're thinking five or ten years from, there, from now, where is Taiwan going to be on the world stage? And is their, their bully going to come in and just say, hey, you know what, we really appreciate the work you've all tried to do, and, we, uh, and we'll take it over right now. Thank you. So each of you, if you just weigh in, and I know you don't have a lot of time to do this, but thank you so much for taking a day out of your life to come here and explain to us what it is that we're losing in its market share. 
Thank you so much. Um, I will just say very briefly that I have not given up hope that in five or 10 years uh, that at least Taiwan will continue to be autonomous, that it will be safe, that it will have a prosperous economy, and maybe even be more integrated in, into the regional economy, the global economy, and the international community more broadly. Um, I'd like to see Taiwan participating in the World Health Organization, yeah. um, ICAO, other uh, UN organizations. Just, so just, I, it, just for a minute, though, that's going to take the rest of the world backing any type of agreement and not backing away from it because of the significant economic influence China has over them. I guarantee you, when they start calling in their loans, they're not going to wait for people to, to get on board. So I, I get it, but uh, I really am concerned that we have given up so much market share and rely on somebody else who's a bad actor to somehow think we're gonna, they're going to suddenly start playing fair, not with just us, but the rest of the world. So I, I appreciate where you're coming from. I also have a lot of hope. I go to Mass every day praying that somehow it's going to happen, but at the end of the day, what I really need to do is pray for the strength for me to do it myself. The Lord's pretty busy with other things. I think the trend is in the right direction. I hope so. There's I been more so. and more countries that uh, are willing to I hope so. I've got 10 children, that, 10 grandchildren that are waiting on us to, get, to step up. Okay. Mr. Wu. Uh, Congressman, I'm the son of a machinist who's a steel worker, so I think I know, right, uh, I come from the heartland, I know the damage that has been done through globalization. I see it. Uh, on the other hand, though, um, no country in this high-tech age can be an island. And your point here is that uh, we've forged ties for efficiency's sake, for cost sake, which as a business person you know is if you're rewarded short-term quarters, right, that's what you're focused on, but it doesn't serve the country's needs. And we need to be looking at trusted suppliers that are integrated that we can rely upon when these geostrategic events happen as they did this past February, we can count on them to act together with us to counter that. I think Taiwan is a part of that equation, but it's really what we do in the next couple of years that will determine five to 10 years from now whether or not it's a secure piece um, in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. So I think with a trade agreement, as I, t I t talked about in my testimony, right, you need much stronger rules of origin, you need rapid response mechanisms so you're not relying on multi-year litigation, you need an escape hatch, as we created in USMCA, uh, because politics change in democracies, as we know in our own democracy, and Taiwan is a democracy. And so that's the type of safety valves that I built into a trade agreement with Taiwan. But I don't think you can leave it alone. I think that will be dangerous to I'm not saying security. to walk away from it, but uh, when there's a bully in the room, usually it's the bully that ends up winning unless the rest of the playground shows up. Uh, to, to defend the person that's being offended. So I, I, I like the idea, of, I, I have eternal hope, uh, but uh, looking at game films really helps me to understand what we should expect from who we're playing next. Thank the gentleman. I'm sorry, I ran out of time. Uh, all right, thank the gentleman. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, uh, let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to inquire. You thank you. Thank you so are. much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members. I had a very difficult time hearing some of the really important discussion that was going on, my technical difficulties. So that, uh, so forgive me if I uh, repeat some areas that have already been covered. Um, you all seem to, um, uh, everybody seems to be convinced that we ought to build some sort of uh, formal trade re relation with Taiwan. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm questioning in this order, Mr. Wu and Ms. Glazer and Ms. Bader uh, Lau, um, whether or not, number one, you think that there's a break even point in terms of our reaching out and expanding our partnerships and trade agreements with other countries that will or will not trigger uh, the mainland to be involved. I mean, how do we do all these workarounds uh, and not trigger some hostility from the mainland? Um, number two, um, uh, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how uh, a lot of countries may not be engaging because there's an element of trust that uh, has to continue to be established. Uh, and I'm wondering, I have a company that Ms. Uh, Bader Blau, you mentioned in your testimony, Foxconn, where we were outfoxed and conned um, uh, uh, in, in, in a deal that promised billions of dollars and good paying jobs 
uh, in exchange for taxpayers building infrastructure, which of course never happened. And then thirdly, Mr. Wu, I want you to elaborate a little bit on what you meant by we can't just have a cut and paste uh, uh, trade agreement with Taiwan. And if it differs from others, uh, to what extent are we going to have to compromise with some of the problematic areas like the labor agreements or like intellectual property, or if you're not referring to, to that as, not, as carve outs that we need to, to find, what exactly are you talking about? So I will yield so that you guys can answer. Starting with you, Mr. Wu. Thank you. Um, let me start with your last question. Uh, what I meant was, um, I think we need to rethink uh, how we, uh, how tight we write rules of origin. They need much tighter than what we've seen uh, with uh, other trade agreements in Asia. I think we need much stronger labor enforcement mechanisms than we've seen in other parts of trade agreements with Asia. And as I alluded to in my testimony, right, we, uh, given its interdependence with the PRC, um, I think we need to be looking at this in conjunction with not just trade agreements, but um, other elements of an economic statecraft, including investment, export controls, and so forth. I'm so starting to sound a little bit like a broken record. Um, but, uh, but I think I just want to reiterate just how important important that is, is all of that. And that's why I think the cookie cutter approach won't work. Thank you for the, the question. I, I wanted to first just clarify that my organization, the Solidarity Center, does not take um, positions on specific individual uh, trade agreements. But I would say I, I um, appreciate your uh, questions and important comments. And I, I think I have not yet successfully underscored just actually how neglectful the United States and Taiwan have in fact been in regards to workers' rights, both in Taiwan and in Taiwanese supply chains. We've been glad to see uh, withhold release orders to block the import of goods made with forced labor. That's really good, really important that we uh, enforce those laws, but it's not enough. Uh, we need to um, demand that and work together jointly with uh, Taiwan and its um, institutions of uh, civil society to ensure that we have improved laws and standards in, in Taiwan. I, I also wanted to make the point that you mentioned Foxconn. Uh, Taiwanese companies, why not United States and Taiwan agree to break the mold and agree bilaterally to support a, the movement inside Taiwan actually to develop legislation that requires Taiwan's companies operating overseas to apply UN and international labor organizations standards to their supply chains, mandatory due diligence, full application of labor standards, binding negotiated agreements with workers and their supply chains. In this way, the companies of Taiwan operating in the United States or across uh, Southeast Asia or anywhere in the world can be a part of actually expanding rights and democracy for workers all over the world. So I appreciate your question and thanks for the opportunity. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, with that, let me recognize- Mr. Laser, I have. Oh. Uh, I think the gentlelady's time has expired. Back. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here today. Um, you know, I, I, when I think about trade agreements, I think, I think of them as being the icing on the cake for Americans and American workers. Yeah. But the most important thing that we have to do here in America is have have the, have the right environment that makes us the most competitive place in the world to do business. The right tax code, the right regulatory environment, the right education environment. Um, you, you go down the list. We need to be driving things that drive American business and workers to succeed all around the world. And so one of the things that I struggle with right now is even though we've been, fair, we've been very anemic in the trade space right now, We've been putting ourselves behind by destroying American energy independence, by, by creating the environment where inflation is, is, is just running rampant, um, really looking at uh, you know, the broken supply chains that have just yet to get back online. You know, it, it, I worry deeply that with the growing debt that, that we have, and I worry about the fact that we are no longer energy independent, and we are relying on some very bad actors, um, and certainly here in the short term for, 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 for our needs. I worry that that, no matter what trade deal that we work out, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be behind the curve on that. So I think it's incumbent upon Congress to make sure that we put the policies in place that make America the most competitive place in the world to do business. 
Once we do that, then we need to have the robust trade agreements in place. Um, and, and many of the things that we've talked about on both sides of the aisle here are very important in that. Um, <clears throat> as we look at uh, an agreement with Taiwan, Mr. Wu, first question to you. Um, China's there is Taiwan's largest trading partner with about $100 billion worth of trade. What are the things there that we, that we as Americans should look to be competitive in and take market share away from China and bring it here to the U.S.? What, give, me a, give me a couple of uh, sectors real quickly that, that we should be competing in there. Where, where are the opportunities for Americans? I know, we, I know ag is a big one. I'm going to get to that in a second. But what are other opportunities there for, for American business and companies? So um, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Just to make sure I'm answering correctly, where should we be looking to displace Chinese imports in the Taiwanese market? Yes. So let me touch on And I think it's not just about the exports. It's also about displacing right, Taiwanese firms choosing to invest their capital in the United States as opposed to uh, mainland China. Um, I, I'd highlight three for you, obviously, high tech on semiconductors. Um, and the electronic supply chain and the manufacturing that's there. Um, on renewable technologies, which I alluded to earlier, um, which is very important also in your state in terms of batteries and the rest of the renewable technologies. Uh, and then the last I would say is on biotech, pharmaceuticals, and so forth. Taiwanese farms are looking to the mainland. We are extremely competitive in that area. These are all areas we can be working on, and these are high, uh, high wage growth areas that support America. Uh, on the biotech, would you agree that um, when we do a trade agreement with Taiwan, that the intellectual property protections and in in those be incredibly strong for the U.S. Absolutely. And, and, and there I, should never be an opportunity to erode that and give that away to, uh, to, to other countries. Absolutely. And as I highlighted in my written testimony, not just the laws themselves, but enforcement and specifically increasing criminal enforcement against economic espionage. All right, thank you, Mr. Wu. Uh, Mr. Bonin, um, you know, you've, you've talked about how the, the anemic trade environment that, that we find ourselves in has put American farmers behind because we're losing market share to producers in other parts of the world. How important it is, not just with uh, Taiwan, but around the world, that we become incredibly active in, in trade negotiations and start taking market share back and growing our markets. Thank you for the question, Congressman. And, and uh, I mentioned that a little bit in my in my opening statement. It, it's critically important for American agriculture. Uh, I mentioned that you know, depending on the year, uh, when 30 percent of net farm income in this country relies on exports, uh, that pretty much tells you the story. And you know, and, and uh, you know, through technology, through uh, th through a lot of things, our American farmers have become extremely productive, and uh, uh, exports are are just important everywhere. We, we, we look at the world as our customer. Uh, that, that's the way we look at it. And uh, we look forward to uh, working to trading agreements all across the world. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady, how are you doing? Good, sir. Uh, enhanced uh, economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific has an enormous potential to support workers and support workers' rights and counter the dangerous reach of China. We cannot stick our head in the sand and just hope the world gets better. In 94, a trade and investment framework with Taiwan, Taiwan was established and there was an opportunity to negotiate within this framework. I understand that with the U.S.-Taiwan initiative on the 21st century trade, the administration does not intend to seek ratification in Congress. That's my understanding. This agreement aims to establish high standard commitments and the economically meaningful outcomes. That sounds like something Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution would regulate. Mr. Wu, thank you for your testimony today and great panel we had, everybody. Would it be beneficial for this agreement to be submitted to the Congress of the United States, in your estimation? 
let me answer your question, uh, Congressman, and thank you for that question in two parts, right? One, wearing my law professor hat. Um, in terms of uh, that submission, right, uh, regulation of foreign commerce, as the chairman highlighted in his opening statement, as you mentioned, right, this is a delegated authority. So this august body has control over the scope of that delegation. Uh, generally, but also specifically with regards to Taiwan. Were it to come before this body, and that's a constitutional question, but were it to come to this body, would there be benefits that it would signal? Certainly. It would signal the bipartisan support that comes across, not just across parties, but across different parts of our government. It would signal, right, that this is, um, finds the support uh, in terms of uh, a wide swath of American workers, farmers, ranchers, and so forth, uh, that this is beneficial. So it would certainly provide the type of input um, that would be beneficial that, uh, instead of uh, this being moving. So Article Article 8 does not apply here? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Well, what I, are you saying? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm saying that, I'm saying that uh, this regulation under Article 1 absolutely applies, right, and that you hold the scope of that delegation in terms of uh, how much you choose to delegate to the executive branch. Taiwan's uh, fishing fleet is the second largest in the world. Second largest. There are reports that crews on Taiwan vessels often face confiscation, physical verbal abuse, and lack of payment. These are the hallmarks of forced labor. We've seen them in too many other places that we've traded, and we're trying to change that, use the influence that we do have. Customs and Border Protection cracked down on abuses by issuing three withhold release orders on Taiwanese ships. Ms. Shana Bader Blau, your testimony suggests that Taiwan's officials are getting serious on combating this practice. I heard this in other countries, too. Most of the time, it's baloney. Please describe what the CBP can share with our partners to ensure compliance with our forced labor laws. And please, describe how Taiwan can be better stewards of the supply chain. Thank you for the important question. Um, the, it is very important that we enforce our own laws um, and the withhold, withhold release orders. That was a good move uh, by Customs and Border Patrol. The United States and Taiwan should work together to heavily sanction abusive companies that do, in fact, trap workers in debt bondage and forced labor, uh, particularly in deep sea fishing. There's been a, an enormous number of very excellent recommendations that have come out of human rights bodies in Taiwan itself that are not being um, applied. There are also recommendations from Taiwan's own labor movement, including a fishing union, that should be uh, listened to and acted upon. I think this is an area that should be immediately addressed, and we've neglected for too long. Well, next month, the uh, Chinese Communist leader, Xi Jinping, will likely secure an unprecedented third term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now proceed with committee practice to go to a two-to-one ratio. So let me recognize Mr. Davis to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank all of the witnesses for your very insightful information and, and, and the way you see things. Um, Ms. Bonnie Glazer, you indicated that we are involved both psychologically and, I guess, militarily in a sense, from reading your testimony. Um, how do we deal with both aspects of what has taken place, the conflict that exists in terms of China and, and, and Taiwan, and, and what recommendations would you have for the U.S. as we try to navigate the environment uh, and continue relationships with both? Thank you for the question, Congressman. As I noted, uh, Taiwan faces an enormous amount of uh, pressure 
from the People's Republic of China. It is, it is military, economic, um, it is uh, psychological. There's a great deal of disinformation that goes on. Uh, there is much that the United States, I think, is already doing, and certainly more we can do. Uh, there is a, 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 a bill, for example, that is uh, being marked up by the Senate today that, continue, that considers giving Taiwan uh, foreign military financing uh, that would help with uh, enabling Taiwan to purchase more uh, arms. And of course, under the Taiwan Relations Act, we continue to sell arms uh, to Taiwan to enable it to defend itself and to deter Chinese aggression. There's much more that we can do in the area of um, economics and trade. Uh, this is the, the pillar of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship that is weakest. Uh, we have strengthened the military and defense pillar. We have strengthened the diplomatic pillar. But I think that this, it is this economic and trade pillar that continues to remain weak and is crucially important for Taiwan's prosperity and security. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Blau, you've had uh, a great deal of experience dealing with the issues of human rights, of worker rights, of humane approaches. Um, obviously, we have some issue with some of the things that are taking place in Taiwan, yet we really want to continue our trade relationship and continue to promote more activity even with the country. How do we reconcile the two? I mean, how do we do one and at the same time deal effectively with promoting our thoughts and ideas relative to humanity, fair treatment, worker rights? Thank you for that really important question. I believe as two societies committed to democracy and, and being open societies, we have a duty to support each other in our development of human rights standards. In the case of the relationship between the United States and Taiwan, we have neglected attention to core labor rights and standards in the country. And uh, right, in, right now, we have an opportunity to make that um, change through these discussions about expanded trade. Um, and I believe that uh, working directly uh, together we, and setting common goals, it's really important that the United States, workers in the United States and uh, Taiwan both experience expanded trade to benefit workers, not just corporations. And to do that, we need strong labor protections, worker rights, bargaining, and enforcement of labor laws. And that should be the way democracies cooperate with each other. Well, thank you. Thank you both very much. I visited Taiwan, and I've never been more impressed with any country's creativity or ability to create things. I, I mean, I saw more gadgets and items than I've ever seen any place in the world. So I, I, I hope that we can work on both ends and, and continue to have the benefit of those relationships. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of our witnesses for being here today. I mean, today's discussion is centered around an issue that uh, has, has broad bipartisan support, and the United States is eager to strengthen trade relations with the Taiwanese people. Uh, I had the opportunity last month to, to go to Southeast Asia and, and visit several countries there, and, and everyone said that they wanted the United States more engaged in trade negotiations with countries throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, each of us today here has a vested interest in expanding markets and, and reducing barriers for our constituents to engage, uh, engage in the robust global markets. For the Kansans I represent, uh, Taiwan represents our ninth largest trading partner, responsible for over $314 million in exports. We're an ag and manufacturing state, and it's critical for Kansas farmers, ranchers, aviation, and other manufacturers to have market access to, to sell products around the world and the world's ready to buy from us. Uh, trade deals, when done right, uh, strengthen America. It's also important to recognize the trade 
uh, with the United States uh, will help bolster our friends in Taiwan. Certainly, nothing provides more strength and stability for an island than a strong economic base. Pursuing greater trade relations between the United States and Taiwan should be welcome on the world stage. But we know that the Chinese Communist Party is working to close off the people of Taiwan, and they have no uh, interest in seeing a stronger U.S.-Taiwan relationships. I hope this administration makes clear that we support a strong Taiwan from any unprovoked aggression. With that in mind, I want, I want to highlight that all of our discussions around trade so far have been merely speculative and hopeful, uh, as the Biden administration continues to have no real plan to increase trade. This de facto trade moratorium is crippling our ability to provide economic growth here at home and is a giant missed opportunity for our friends and allies around the world. And it only aids the, the Chinese Communist Party under their Belt and Road Initiative. I want to end by saying that I'm hopeful that all of our, our trade talk today can, can uh, focus on how do we uh, desire to enhance trade with Taiwan and how we can turn that into action and that we can once again lead the world in free and fair trade. Congress is tasked with uh, negotiating uh, commerce with uh, foreign countries in, 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 a, in a constitution, and I urge my colleagues on the left to stand with, behind their desires for trade by working with Republicans to renew the Trade Promotion Authority. Kansans and Americans will benefit. Mr. Mr. Benning, I, I know the folks at the Kansas Farm Bureau are always eager to see open markets for grain and, and goods, and, and I imagine the Texas Farm Bureau is the same. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the trade agreement with Taiwan that uh, ex expands market access for farmers and ranchers, and, and how, what would that do for your constituents, and, and do you think the Biden administration is doing enough to help expand that? Thank you, Congressman, for, for the question. Um, well, you know, beef has been mentioned quite a bit in, in my comments, and, and beef is, is, is our biggest commodity in the state of Texas. It's very important in Kansas as well, and, and I'm very aware of that. Uh, so there's things that can be done there. A free trade agreement would help would help our producers tremendously, uh, and you know we can produce a lot of product throughout through, throughout this country, and uh, we need that market. I've already talked a little bit about uh, um, the current administration, uh, what they've done, and 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 we appreciate that, but quite frankly, we feel like they can do more, uh, but. You know, that's kind of a that's kind of a two-edged sword, I guess, so to speak, because because we look for markets. Agriculture looks for markets. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if it's you know something tree, tree nuts or apples that are produced in on the West Coast or or, or beef or, or other things you know through the Midwest. Um, so we always we're, we're we're always looking for better markets. And I and I want to say right now while I have this opportunity, is I appreciate. What I'm hearing today from this committee, uh, I, I, I feel like it, that, it, that it is that it can be put on the front burner, so to speak, because that's where we we believe it needs to be, and we're not so sure that it's been on the front burner. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of sum it up that way. Yeah, I, I I think you're right in terms of saying that over the last couple of years, there's not been enough done. And uh, uh, whether you're talking about bipart uh, bilateral or, or trilateral, multilateral uh, agreements, uh, and, and partic particularly just making sure that the United States involvement, engagement, and interaction with uh, particularly countries in the Indo-Pacific region is important. And obviously, Taiwan's a big part of that to help with their, their uh, uh, democracy and their growth there. So thank you all today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing, and thank you very much to the witnesses for your participation here. Uh, since the People's Republic of China became a member of the World Trade Organization back in 2001, we've seen China continue and increasingly refuse to play by the rules. Over the last decade, we've seen China regularly steal intellectual property circumvent our trade laws, retaliate against American businesses or other countries when they speak out in support of human rights or democracies, including Taiwan. As the world's largest economy, it's important that we strengthen our relationship with countries around the world, including in Asia, to continue to grow our economy, to export our products, and build stronger economic relationships with countries who share our values. Taiwan is a friend of the United States and its standards as compared to other places in the region and in the world 
are higher. We, we need to do more to encourage that, but it's clearly uh, a relationship that we want to be able to foster, and it's a place we can do business. So as we look to deepen and strengthen our relationships in Asia, it's important that we build off the success of recent agreements, like the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement led uh, by us here on the Ways and Means Committee. With any two countries, there will always be disagreements over trade policy, but what we've accomplished with USMCA, for example, and what con with Congress asserting its constitutional role regarding the regulation of trade, we should, we should see that as a roadmap. Congress made the USMCA deal better for American workers and helped to create longer lasting sound trade policy that will benefit all parties, including workers in Mexico. As we look to our trade relationship with Taiwan, I'm specifically concerned about issues regarding agriculture and trade barriers currently in place in Taiwan that discriminate against U.S. agriculture. Specifically, the U.S. pork market, its access to Taiwan has been at the top of the list of negotiating objectives for the U.S. government for over a decade. Taiwan announced that it would be liberalizing trade for U.S. pork in August of 2019, but instead we've seen a sharp decline in U.S. pork exports from 54 million in 2020 to just 16 million in 2021 and continued declines this year. So, Mr. Banning, if I could ask you uh, to comment, uh, can you highlight from your perspective ways that Taiwan could eliminate some of these trade barriers, uh, such as those against pork, and how maybe the U.S. could increase enforcement uh, to complement those actions to support U.S. agriculture. Thank you, Congressman. Um, well, you, you've already you mentioned the figures and, and how much it went down in just the last year when it, regarding pork sales. And specifically, from what we understand, uh, the, the ractopamine uh, ban, uh, their zero tolerance there needs to be looked at. Uh, figures that I've seen is, is uh, like you said, it went down to $16 million last year of pork. We think it could go up into the $150 million range. Uh, so that goes back to having trade agreements and, and, them, and, and, and your partners recognizing sound science and, and things like that, that, that you have to, you, you just have to hammer out. Uh, and, and that's why we think it's so, and that's the only way that you can, that we're gonna get there is with some ni direct negotiation and, and, and things that can be enforced after we come to an agreement. For sure, I appreciate that. I today just actually met with some of the Michigan pork producers and you know, they, we, we live up to very high standards here. We ought to be able to uh, to leverage that to access markets where we could do very well. Mr. Wu, I wonder if you might just comment more broadly, generally, and I know this may be somewhat redundant, but I'm, I'm anxious to get your strength just more broadly on how th this Congress could work with Taiwan to strengthen the relationship with the U.S., but particularly to do what we can to bring Taiwan out from the sphere of in influence of China. I know it's a broad question, but if you could just Take the remaining 30 seconds and give us a full tutorial. I'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure I can do so in the remaining time, but I'll try to do so very quickly, right? I think trade is one part of that pillar, but I think there's the uh, military dimension as well. And I think there is a part which you all oversee in terms of investment screening, in terms of uh, R&D support, cooperation, in terms of joint standards development, support for emerging technologies, critical technologies beyond semiconductors. Um, there are things that you all are doing and can continue to do that will be important to keep Taiwan integrated in the global supply chains. Thank you. Let me uh, now recognize a gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Uh, I'd like to just test a little more deeply with Ms. Glazer and Mr. Wu, you know, when, um, on, on this idea of the trade agreement. When Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan in early August, um, there was a lot of debate about whether this was provocative or not. We certainly saw the way the PRC reacted, um, you know, violating the, that, that line in the middle of the strait, uh, lots of live fire exercises, airplanes ever. I went a couple of weeks later and they were still overflying um, the island and the beach uh, day in and day out. She has said that he wants um, another five years of the next Congress and his number one priority is reunification. 
why will they not see this trade agreement as provocative? Um, why does this bring us closer to peace rather than make a kinetic response for, for reunification more likely? I'm like a spider monkey. I don't even know what I'm playing like. Congressman, um, let me first say that there, um, uh, with all due respect, Xi Jinping has never said that his first priority is reunification. He has said that reunification with Taiwan, with Taiwan, of Taiwan with China, is a historical mission of the party. It is inevitable, and every Chinese leader before him has said the same thing. What he has said is that reunification is a requirement for the achievement of national rejuvenation, the target for which is 2049, that is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. We don't really know where it falls on his list of priorities. There are some people who have said that there is a 2027 deadline. I continue to believe, again, there is no evidence for that. So we have to make sure that we are pursuing policies that influence Xi Jinping's cost-benefit analysis so that he will conclude that the costs are too high to move against Taiwan. And so I think we do have to be careful. We should not do things with Taiwan that have no meaningful impact and strengthen its security, but provoke China. I think that those are bad policies, and there are some of those that are under consideration. But the things that we do that will really significantly enhance Taiwan's prosperity, and, and they have a say in it, it's not just us, if they want also to negotiate a good trade agreement that would benefit both of our countries and our peoples, then I think they, they're willing to perhaps pay some price for that. But let's look at the price that they have paid for Speaker Pelosi's visit on the economic side, pretty small, less than 1% of their um, exports to uh, to mainland China were affected, even though it was like 2,000 products. Well, that, that's very uh, encouraging. Thank you. Mr. Wu, you talked about strengthening Taiwan's IP regulations for protection and enforcement. They're relatively weak right now. Given the enormous amount of trade between the people of Taiwan and the PRC, how do we keep uh, our IP protected uh, against being taken up by the PRC if we expand this with, with Taiwan? So I think coupled with anything we do on the trade initiative, there needs to be a strengthening of uh, enforcement, IP enforcement, IP collaboration, but particularly criminal enforcement against economic espionage, right? Any uh, type of economic relations as, as deep as that which Taiwan and PRC have will lead to instances of economic espionage as we've seen on the semiconductor front. Um, it's about creating deterrence just as on the military front, deterrence on the IP actions and having there be consequences for the bad actors involved and having collaboration between our IP enforcement officials. Great, thank you. Ms. Bader Blau, you go on for a number of pages about the challenges for workers in Taiwan. Um, the 30 workers to form a union, the, the yellow unions and the craft unions, the civil servants can't form trade unions. Um, it's, the right to strike is, is unusual. The longest number of hours in the world. We've all said on this committee, Democrat and Republican, that USMCA is the gold standard now for trade agreements moving forward. Do you have any confidence that Taiwan will be able to live up to USMCA labor standards? Uh, having spent the last uh, couple of weeks in particular having detailed conversations with labor organizations and unions in Taiwan, I'm absolutely convinced that workers in Taiwan would have an enormously important and effective role to play in and addressing some of the weaker laws and standards in the country if they're highlighted and given a chance to do so. And I think that any discussion between the United States and Taiwan about expanding trade needs to center those voices and those ideas. And then, yes, the answer can be it is possible. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, witnesses. Uh, I want to especially recognize the leadership of Russell Benning, my fellow Texan, for his leadership on agriculture issues, being a champion for the industry, for a, for a strong ag economy, for our farmers and ranchers that bless this nation with uh, food security, which is national security. So God bless Texas, and God bless our farmers across the country. I had a friend tell me once, Mr. Chairman, after all is said and done, more is said than done in Washington. There's a fellow named Kent Hance who used to have my, my uh, position representing West Texas. That couldn't be more true 
about a single issue than trade under this administration. There's been no leadership. Uh, I hate to say it, it's a sad commentary, but just like in football, you're either going forward or backwards, you're either moving closer to the goal line and scoring points, or you're moving backwards. And we're not only missing opportunities, we are losing ground. It's taken 20 months for this administration to put forward a U.S. trade rep chief ag negotiator. We have trade promotion authority, which is relatively benign, important, but benign in terms of its politics. It's a nonpartisan, non-controversial issue, and that hasn't happened in two years. More evidence that this isn't a priority is that we are not enforcing the hard work and all the effort put into USMCA, which should be a template for more free trade deals. It was bipartisan, helped workers, it helped our farmers, it helped manufacturers, and it might as well not have happened at all, because if you don't enforce it, it's not worth the paper it's written on. We said that repeatedly on both sides of the aisle, and we're not opening new markets and taking advantage of the fact that in agriculture, there's gonna be a global food shortage. This is an opportunity for American producers to satisfy global demand, new demand, after what's happening in Europe, supply chain problems, et cetera. It also will help bolster our economy at a time when we've had a, a shrinking GDP, where we have record inflation, labor shortages, and we're struggling in our own right with a recession, and it will enhance America's security interest, and it will help diffuse the control that our adversaries like China have on our allies, freedom-loving allies like the good people of Taiwan. I mean, the opportunities are there and we're just squandering it with inaction. Um, so my first point is President Biden is MIA, just completely MIA on trade. And uh, second point is that we're all learning, relearning, some very important lessons and principles of foreign policy. First, weakness invites aggression. Weakness is provocative. There's not an American out there that doesn't believe that the debacle in Afghanistan, and I won't go through the litany of botched and bad decisions, but that on top of our slow and, and, and uh, reticent response to a year of Russia's planning to invade Ukraine with no preemptive action on a part of the United States. And then we have a wide open border, say what you want about you know, immigration, we can debate that till the cows come home, but that's our sovereign border and we've ceded control of it to terrorist uh, drug cartels. What does that say to China and our adversaries around the world? The, the second piece of this is that energy security is national security. I, I, I submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, an article that talks about Russia shutting down completely the main artery of natural gas to Europe. It says the halt comes as European nations race to fill gas storage facilities, prevent a shortage in the midst of winter. Shortages would trigger rationing, likely kneecapping industry and tipping the continent's already struggling economy into recession. Another article, Europe is at the forefront. Of, they're on the front lines, rather, of the economic war between Russia and the West that runs parallel to the battlefield in Ukraine. Soaring electricity prices and a shortage of natural gas have hammered the European economy and raised concerns about the blackouts and shortages this winter. People will literally freeze to death because Europe's weakness relative to the people they desperately need in Russia and the petro tyrant Vladimir Putin for their energy supply. Now, we got a whole country that is literally an island unto itself, but it is also with respect to energy. We could do so much to bless the world and our allies, but we, we can't get out of our own way because we're punishing oil and gas and we're assaulting oil and gas, and it's not only hurting America, it's, it's destabilizing the world, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Philadelphia. Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate this opportunity. Mr. Wu, a uh, question I'd like to ask to you. Since 2005, my home state of Pennsylvania has had investments and trade offices in Taiwan. The office closed unexpectedly in early 2021 due to budget concerns, but it was reopened in March of this year due to efforts from state legislators 
who saw the importance and potential expansion of economic relations with the island. Before its closure, Taiwan office facilitated 80% of the trade between Pennsylvania and Taiwan. So how important are offices such as these in supporting and expanding economic relations between the U.S. and Taiwan? I think they're very important because the people-to-people -people ties are very critical for making sure that people understand the opportunities that are available, uh, where America's competitive strengths are, um, some of the concerns that have uh, surfaced in consumer markets, making sure that those get addressed. So I think they're absolutely critical. Uh, any thoughts or recommendations you have in terms of uh, the, the process? In terms of I think in terms of um, th those types of relationships and how they filter back into what you all are doing here, I think um, a lot of the work on trade facilitation um, it helps uh, to really sort of grease that wheel um, in terms of making sure that there's transparency and regulations because the regulatory barriers are so important. Uh, I think also in terms of uh, thinking uh, in terms of uh, the types of services that get created, um, oftentimes those come about through these types of people to people types of uh, connections. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Uh, you're back to bounce some of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, joining us uh, today. As others have said, um, there could be no more timely moment to have this hearing than now, and I think we've been blessed with some uh, ex expert witness uh, testimony. China is a uh, threat to our nation. Uh, I, I talk about it. I hear about it from my um, constituents. We talk about it here on the Hill. Uh, I think, uh, Ms. Glasser, you, you said it very well. It's worth re repeating it. The first half of the 21st century will be defined by a systemic competition between the capitalist democracy championed by the United States and its allies in the authoritarian state-led economy advanced by the People's Republic of China and other countries. Um, and I, I think it's something that is not just an immediate challenge, but obviously a very long-term challenge uh, for us as we put together our strategies. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Wu, and, and then I'll come to uh, Ms. Glazer as well. But Mr. You, Wu, you talked about the Market Access Plus Agreement. It's beyond the bilateral trade uh, negotiations, but we need to be talking about export control, investment screening, uh, other, other matters. Uh, can you talk about the significant steps we should be taking and the way we should be evaluating uh, any proposed agreement to make sure that we're achieving that uh, market access plus agreement? Uh, sure. Uh, let me uh, elaborate a bit, which is to say, right, um, market access by itself um, can be beneficial, but it can also be dangerous if it serves as a way to leak out American capital, American technology, uh, American knowledge, and so forth. So we need to make sure that those other guardrails, uh, those safeguards are in place, right? And that uh, we exercise control over that here, but with any type of trading partner, we need to trust that they will continue to do that once it's flowed over to our partner. So in that sense, I think this is not just oversight over what USTR is doing in the 21st Century Initiative. It's also with regards to what commerce, state, treasury, and other elements um, that all fall under uh, the scope of the Congress's uh, authority here to oversee. All of that needs to be done in lockstep. Great. And, and Ms. Glaser, you, you talked about the five reasons in your opening statement of why we need to pursue a bilateral trade agreement. Um, again, if, if you could expand on that, because it's not just the immediate challenge we face. We've talked about uh, that at length here today. But uh, looking beyond into the next, as you said, the, the first half of the century, uh, sitting here at 2022, winding down at the end of this year, looking forward to the next 20, 30 years. That's an excellent question, Congressman. And um, I really want to agree with you on China's ambitions. Uh, you know, when Xi Jinping first came to power, uh, and he hadn't yet become president, he was general secretary of the party, he made a speech that did not become public until years later, in which he said that socialism must defeat capitalism. 
So they, Xi Jinping believes that his governance system is superior to ours. And so we really are competing in the governance. Um, and so what we really need to do is to deliver a better system of governance to our own people here in America. And then so many people around the world who admire the United States, they're a little concerned about some of what has happened in this country over the last few years. They would like to see American soft power be strong again. So the most important thing that we need to do is to strengthen America. And then I think we will be able to successfully compete with China. We'll be able to strengthen that network of the alliances and partners around the world that want to stand with us and want to push back against the kind of norms and values that China is pushing, not only in uh, the developing world, but in international organizations like the United Nations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And in, in the minute I have left, I know we have votes calling, so I, I will yield back, but I just want to take a second to thank uh, uh, the chairman of the committee for, for having this hearing at a time that is so crucial and understanding the, the critical importance of focusing on, on our relations uh, with ta Taiwan, having uh, this trade agreement. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schmucker, is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for being here. I represent the 11th district in Pennsylvania, which Mr. Benning is a strong agricultural uh, district, always interested in ensuring that we have robust markets around the world, also a strong manufacturing district. So trade, very important to uh, my constituents in, in the district that I represent. And there's not a lot of daylight here today uh, between the views of uh, both parties. And that's, by the way, that's somewhat unusual as a Ways and Means uh, hearing uh, this year, if you haven't been watching, uh, but it's, it's encouraging. And I've learned so much from each of you about uh, uh, not only the importance of, of whether well, of the strategic por importance of, of doing this, um, and you've also so I think all of you agree it's important we do a bilateral trade agreement for a variety of reasons uh, for those markets for the geopolitical security in the area and so on and so forth, but yet it doesn't seem to be happening. We are not. You all have also agreed, or most of you at least have agreed that. You didn't think that you think the administration could be doing more, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you've you've pretty much said that. So my my question literally is, what all of us in a bipartisan basin, all of you, see the real, very real benefits um, in strengthening those ties in achieving a bilateral agreement. So why isn't it occurring? We also have heard today, I think that Taiwan would mostly see it's beneficial. We know there are issues that would need to be worked out, um, but it seems that almost all parties involved think this is perhaps critical uh, for the region that we do this, um, and yet the administration doesn't seem to be moving. So I'd, I'd like to hear from each of you, and maybe I'll start with Nick Glauser, why do you think that's occurring? And like, what's your strategy? What could we be doing to, to sort of move the move the ball down the field on this. Um, and again, this perhaps is a criticism of the administration because particularly, at least on the Republican side, we feel like there has not been enough attention given to new trade agreements. We think there's a lot of opportunity out there. But it's also, I'd really like to know, what, what, what objection do you think exists within the administration to being uh, to, to really moving uh, on a bilateral agreement. If you just respond, and I'll give everybody an opportunity to do that if you'd like. Ms. Claus, do you want to start? Yes, please. I thought it was last, not first. Apologies. Um, you know, quick answer um, so that everybody will have time. You have a lot of cheerleaders in the administration, actually, who work on the Indo-Pacific, who work on Taiwan, who work on China, who really would like to see a trade agreement with Taiwan. So, so why isn't it happening? My understanding is that you have other people in the administration who want to focus on uh, worker-centered um, uh, 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 economic policy and believe that our trade agreements in the past have not benefited American workers. And so they have set that aside, particularly with Taiwan, to do something else and they are not negotiating trade agreements. I'm not a trade expert, but I feel like on the list of priorities in this administration, as you say, trade is not very high because they're worried about the negative impact on American workers and, and, and American interests. So it falls to you to persuade them that this is in the interests of Americans, that we can sign 
trade agreements that will benefit us. We can have good trade agreements. And as people have said, the USMCA provides some good things that we can use and apply to Taiwan. Thank you. Mr. Wu? Uh, Congressman, I'm going to give you a slightly different answer, although I don't disagree. Um, but uh, the answer that I'm going to give is some of what we see in scope here is driven by politics in Taiwan. It is a democracy just like ours. President Tsai is term limited. Um, there's a desire to get a deal done with her and to get a deal done quickly, and the campaign season is going to kick in in 2023 in Taiwan. So what we have in the 21st Century Initiative is a scope of what people think could be achievable this year in the near term to sort of just get something done. That's a stepping stone to doing more, but as we all know, doing more on trade is very difficult in the campaign season. And we're going to be entering our own 2024. And so that's why I think you've seen the initiative. Um, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's a politically pragmatist approach that's being taken by this administration. Ms. Bowderbla, we have a few seconds. I'm sorry, I don't have time for both of you. Falls outside the expertise of my organization. Yeah. Mr. Benny? Well, uh, you know, j just quickly, I think uh, the USMCA was mentioned. I really can't address why the current administration is not working on it, on uh, Taiwan Harder, but I think if we get encouragement from from this committee, and I know from our organization, we, we work through uh, Secretary uh, uh, Vilsack as well, encouragement there to the administration. Let's use the MCA as the template. Let's, let's, let's show folks that that is a good start. I know there's worker, there, there's worker issues, uh, but we have to start somewhere and just get, I mean, maybe, maybe we won't be successful, but at least let's get around the table and try. Yep. Thank you. Just before I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to inquire, uh, based upon the number of people that still would like to inquire, we'll go as far as we can and then we'll come back. So with that, let me recognize Mr. Swazi to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for holding this uh, hearing today. We are doing the hard work by doing this today. We have the whole world to choose from. We have so many issues to choose from. We're focusing all this energy on Taiwan for these past hours and all the staff work that's gone into preparing for this. Thank you so much to the witnesses for the time that you've spent to help educate us on this issue and to help us look at the positives and negatives related to this relationship. Uh, when President Nixon went to China, 50 years ago, uh, we thought ever since then that the more time that China was exposed to our way of life, to our economic system, uh, to our political system, that they'd become more like us. That just hasn't happened. So it's important for us to point out today, not just the, the saber rattling that's happening in Taiwan, the fact that China cheats in its uh, trade relationships with us, that they steal information technology and, and intellectual property from us. Uh, that they uh, are, have forced labor and forced sterilization and mass surveillance in the Xinjiang region of, with the Uyghurs, that they have uh, oppressed the Tibetans for years, that they are arresting students in, the, in Hong Kong and have suppressed freedom of the press in Hong Kong. Uh, they go on and on with their actions. So this hearing that we're doing here today and the work of this committee and this administration is to try and highlight the importance of our relationship with Taiwan. We must uh, continue to foster this relationship with them. So what are the other positive things we need to do? Well, if we could do a trade agreement with them, a bilateral trade agreement, we could address these problems that we want Taiwan to address. We want them to address these labor issues. We don't like that people are being sequestered on fishing ships. We don't like that their carbon emissions are so high. So this is an opportunity for us to address labor, to, uh, for us to address the environment. This is an opportunity for us to address uh, human rights questions, uh, that's another pro -po positive reason to be doing this. The fact that they have the largest foundries in the world for s semiconductors and we want to have the best access possible to them is important to us as well. So there's so many positives as to why this has to happen. The negative side, the challenges we face, is they have, have to, to agree to address their labor practices. They have to agree to address their environmental practices. They have to agree to address their human rights concerns. And the other big concern is, what's the reaction of our strategic adversary, China, going to be? How far will they go as we promote our relationship with this important trading partner for us and for them? And not just a trading partner for them, but someone that they want to control completely. So my question to each of you is, number one, uh, how likely is it that we will get an accession to our demands regarding labor, the environment, and human rights, would you see it as being a likely thing to happen, or would you see it as being an overwhelming challenge? And secondly, what do we think the reaction of China will be to us 
trying to move towards this type of relationship. So Mr. Wu, I'm gonna ask you to go first. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Uh, 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 Bader Blau on labor. Um, I think on environment, there's a lot of momentum uh, to move forward on that. Um, I think China's reaction, um, so long as it falls in, and let me just reiterate this, right, so long it falls in within the one China policy, within the scope of the existing joint communiques and the assurances and so forth, um, I think China's, uh, China has recognized Taiwan is its own separate WTO member. But it's very important that we continue to buy by that in whatever form uh, the bilateral trade agreement would take. Ms. Bader Blau? Uh, briefly, with respect to the government of Taiwan, I, I can't say specifically. I'll, I can say, however, that with respect to labor organizations in the country, they're very eager to use the spotlight and the attention this is bringing to advance long-held um, concerns that they have had and would uh, take advantage with your support and with the spotlight to uh, improve bargaining, freedom of association, the right to strike, and all the limitations in the country that exist now. You certainly have my support. I serve as a chair, co-chair of the Labor Caucus in Congress. I'm also on the uh, Congressional Executive Commission on China. That's why I'm so fired up about the human rights abuses that we take place all the time. Mr. Boning, do you have anything you want to add, as, especially as far as what you think China's reaction is going to be? No, sir. That's probably out of my wheelhouse. I'm, the experts to my right can address that much better. How about as far as getting concessions from them regarding the agricultural concerns that you've addressed? I, I think. If we sit down at the table, I think, I think we can get there. Yes, sir. Ms. Glazer? China's not going to go to war with Taiwan over a free trade agreement. If we, if we recognize Taiwan as an independent sovereign state, yes, they will. But China's using coercion against Taiwan in any case, right? But this is a meaningful, it's something that Taiwan will benefit Thank from, you. we will benefit from. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for all the time you've spent with us today. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing, and thanks for all of our witnesses uh, for spending a lot of time with us today. Appreciate this and all of your time that you spend on Taiwan outside of this hearing room. Um, I, you know, look, I think it's clear, just based on your testimony, that um, America's Taiwan policy is pretty complicated, and if you look at the history, it's understandable from the one China policy, to the three joint communiques, to the Taiwan Relations Act, to the six assurances, to strategic ambiguity, uh, it's a lot. But fortunately, I think what we can deduce from all of that, and from your testimony today, is that our relationship, the more that our relationship with China becomes frayed, our relationship with Taiwan becomes that much more important. Now, I do believe that we can strengthen our relationship with Taiwan through trade, which could benefit the economies of both partners and put Taiwan in a better position to deal and resist Chinese aggression. Deepening our trade relationship would not only be a smart strategy geopolitically, but like I said, economically. However, and as we've talked about today, there are areas where we have concerns. And as my colleague, Mr. Swazi, just said, we can use trade to set high standards and create new enforcement mechanisms. Now, one of the things that I hear about from my constituents on the Central Coast of California are the SPS regulations that have discriminated against U.S. biotechnology and pesticides without a basis in science. And I've been particularly concerned with uh, IUU, illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, in an area where Taiwan has been pretty notorious in its violations. But trade provides an avenue to address these issues with the promises of increased market access and the threat of strong enfor enforcement. Now, as I talked about, uh, Taiwan is a serious export market for the Central Coast of California and its agricultural market. Uh, it's Monterey County's third largest agricultural export market behind Mexico and Canada. But like I said, our produce, producers have had some serious trouble getting certain crops into Taiwan due to these SPS barriers. Our producers report that their USDA and USTR's counterparts in Taiwan are very slow in responding to communications, and it's often hard to get Taiwan to readily agree to our science. So, um, you know, hopefully the chief agricultural negotiator that is, can get confirmed, Doug McCaleb, and help us address some of these issues. But Mr. Boning, you know I'm looking at you and you know I'm going to come to you. Are your Texas agriculture producers having the same amount of difficulty in communicating with Taiwan as we are in California? 
the short answer there is yes, sir. Uh, you know, and, and that's you know that's why that's why I'm here today, quite frankly. And uh, uh, we did, we we have to work with them to get them to recognize sound science, and and uh, you know it's a difficult thing to do, but I mean that's where that's where it has to start. Exactly. Do you believe a trade a trade agreement could set some of the rules for communication and adherence to sound science? Well, I mean, again, I don't want to overstate this because we know we have we, we we still have to work on the USMCA. We still have to make sure that things are being done right there. But again, that that gave us a template to sh to start. So yes, I, I think we can get there as well. And Mr. Wu, what would you say about that? Do you think a trade agreement could align SPS standards? I think it certainly could do so by creating another enforcement mechanism beyond going to the WTO. And Mr. Wu, let me stick with you. Um, look, I know that you know you said that tariffs are not a main barrier, but they are higher for agriculture than other products. I mean, for example, fruits and vegetables and plants, Taiwan's average tariff is over 21 percent, while the United States is just 4.6 percent. Shouldn't we, re, shouldn't we consider reducing tariffs in addition to reducing non-tariff barriers at a minimum for high-tariff products like fruits and vegetables, Mr. Wu? Absolutely, and it, I, I just want to correct the record right here just to say I did say tariffs are a problem for agricultural goods as well as for our automotive industry. Right. And the, our strategy needs to be market access plus it needs to focus on tariffs, but it also needs to focus on the regulatory elements, and that's where our agriculture as well as our automotive industry are also facing those issues uh, in those areas as well. And Mr. Boning, I'll end with you. Do you think, too, that tariffs should be on the table and at any potential deal with Taiwan? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having this important hearing. You know, I guess we can add to our list of failed energy policy, failed border policy, failed foreign policy, failed fiscal policy, and now a fa failed uh, trade policy. It's, uh, it's kind of sad to see what's going on. I think we all know here today, there's, this has been a very lengthy meeting, and we thank all of you all for being here and being experts in your respective areas. We all know here today that trade is essential to our supply chain and it strengthens our relationships and essential out with essential allies like Taiwan. And our job in Congress has been duly noted and on this committee, uh, this committee especially is to develop trade initiatives that fortify our supply chains and address the market barriers that impede our exports. The Biden administration has neglected our trade relationships at a time when aggressive vigilance for opportunities in this global marketplace should have been a priority. My home state of Oklahoma ranks number nine in imports from Taiwan. We've recently seen significant trade of aerospace parts, nuclear reactors, and electrical machinery from Taiwan. In the future, I would like to see Oklahoma's trade relationship with Taiwan grow. In these and other industries, USTR has discussed the issue of long-standing Taiwanese barriers facing U.S. companies. These include market barriers of U.S. beef producers. Oklahoma ranks number two behind my dear friends from Texas. I don't say that often, but uh, when it comes to this, we're, we're in lockstep together, strengthening our relationship with Taiwan and working through these market access barriers could increase exports to Taiwan, leading to more growth and boosting economic activity in Oklahoma. The Biden administration's cautious approach to trade initiatives is very concerning to all, and we're listening to great testimony on that today. We need a trade agenda that will provide certainty that future agreements create new export opportunities where U.S. businesses and workers benefit. This administration has made no effort to work towards reviving a bipartisan trade promotion authority that expired in July of last year. Without TPA, America leaves a vacuum in the international marketplace that China is willing and all more than happy to take advantage of. All free trade agreements have been approved and implemented through TPA. It would be a mistake for the administration to turn a blind eye to TPA while the international marketplace is manipulated by our allies and competitors solely for their own priorities. TPA supports U.S. job growth, exports of made in America products, and better trade agreements that make the U.S. more competitive globally. Ms. Glasser, you have done a great job today in, in your testimony, and you've also said that you have recommended the enactment of the Trade Promotion Authority legislation. As you know, the Trade Promotion Authority has expired, as we just talked about. Can you speak 
uh, about your recommendation in the past and why the TPA is very important for the United States and our trading partners. So, Congressman, I'm, I'm not a trade expert. There are others on this panel that will do a far better job than I will. But, yes, I do believe that Congress should have TPA, that it will enhance our ability to negotiate good trade agreements with other countries around the world. And it's got to be shocking to you, whether you're an expert or not, it's got to be shocking to you that we haven't done anything in this area for over a year now when we're sitting here and the administration's blaming the supply chain itself for the inflation issues and not the fiscal policy. Mr. Benning. My dear friend from Texas, um, I know a lot of folks have stressed the importance of TPA today, but can you go into detail why an aggressive, ambitious trade agenda is important to maintain a global market share, and how at risk are we of losing these global market shares to our competitors? I guess the best way I can summarize it is, is customers want a reliable source. It doesn't really make any difference what you're buying, right? You, you know, it can be widgets, it can be ag products, it can be whatever. You want a reliable source. When, when you, you know, and there's other folks, you know, we, China's been mentioned a lot, but there's other uh, very important ag producers in this world, whether it be Brazil or uh, Argentina, uh, our folks at the European Union. They, they, when, when, when we lose those markets, and we lose some of those, I believe, when we're not aggressive, uh, it takes years to get those markets back many years often to take the, to get those markets back. So uh, those of us in the ag community are, are very much in favor of TPA, very much in favor of an aggressive uh, trade policy. Any, um, uh, as I mentioned, beef is very important to both of us. Um, are there any tax incentives related to the ag industry that Congress should look, focus on and reforming to encourage trade relations? You know, we've thought about that a little bit, but as far as tax incentives, we go back to the same thing that was mentioned earlier, tariffs. A tariff is a tax. We sit down and eliminate those, and then that eliminates a tax. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I just returned from leading a bipartisan um, congressional delegation to Taiwan, where we met with senior Taiwanese government officials, including President Tsai. Um, she and members of her government expressed uh, interest in deepening the relationship with the United States. And I happen to believe that it's in the interest of the United States to pursue closer relations with Taiwan for both geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, reasons. You know, from a geopolitical perspective, greater trade relations would help insulate uh, Taiwan from Chinese economic coercion. And I think it's important for Taiwan to be able to diversify its trade and supply chains away from China. And in doing so, it gives us, the U.S., a chance to um, fortify our own supply chains, um, particularly in key sectors like semiconductors. Also, deepening economic ties in Asia, um, in the Asia-Pacific region, it signals to other countries in the region that our commitment extends well beyond just the presence of the Seventh Fleet. So I think there's a lot of work that we can do there. Um, I think, though, as we move out on developing those policies, Congress has a vital role to play, um, particularly as it relates to trade liberalization. You know, Congress, and particularly this committee, can't be ignored or bypassed. And while the U.S.-Taiwan initiative on the 21st century trade, it's a welcome sign that this administration has interest in deepening the trade relationship with Taiwan, I think it falls well short of a free trade agreement. Um, it lacks market access commitments, and it limits the potential for substantive economic benefits from new negotiations. Um, and I just think, in, in general, it's a missed opportunity for the further development of trade with Taiwan that can yield significant benefits for American consumers and American businesses. It should be noted also that Taiwan was left out of the uh, IPEF. Um, I'll say that I think IPEF is an empty substitute for U.S. withdrawal from TPP. However, in leaving Taiwan out of IPEF, the U.S. reinforces China's efforts to isolate and punish Taiwan. Um, Taiwan's exclusion also plays into the Chinese disinformation campaign that the U.S. is abandoning Taiwan in the region. In, in practical terms, just go back to IPEF a bit, IPEF is another structure like the 21st Century Trade Initiative that falls short of a real um, free trade agreement. And, you know, these frameworks and initiatives 
they may succeed in allowing the administration to circumvent Congress, but they fail in delivering the full potential of high standard FTAs that can be negotiated with like-minded partners that share our democratic and free market values. And while I understand fully the difficulties of working with Congress, um, I think it's imperative that the Biden administration do so in order to meaningfully expand trade. As representatives, we're the ones that are the closest to the American businesses and the American consumers that are affected by trade, standard, uh, trade deals. And I would urge the administration to seek um, TPA renewal and urge my colleagues to grant it and, and in hopes that we embark on real FTA negotiations with Taiwan. Um, after all, we've demonstrated that we can pass a real free trade agreement in a bipartisan way uh, with the passage of USMCA. And so we've talked a lot about trade, so I want to ask a question about tax treaties, um, because they do have an impact on FDI. You know, um, the United States doesn't have an income tax treaty with Taiwan, and to me, it's one of the most obvious ways we can develop the relationship. We happen to have tax treaties with Belarus, Turkmenistan, um, and even Venezuela, but not Taiwan. Ms. Glasser, can you tell me what you think the challenges to establishing a tax treaty with Taiwan is, and what benefits might be available if we can address this issue? So once again, I'm not a trade expert, so I'm going to have to kick the ball to others, but I know that Taiwan is interested in having a tax agreement that the double taxation um, really hampers um, their ability to work uh, in the U.S. as well and, and invest in the United States. But I will pass it on. Maybe um, Mr. Wu has some ideas. Uh, this falls outside the scope of what I focus on for academic research, so I'm merely going to just simply add, I think there is a question of what forms and what entities would conclude that tax treaty and how we would do so within the scope of uh, the One China policy. I, I think that may be some of the difficulties here, given this is actual uh, fiscal authority and so forth. But again, I'm just merely speculating here. I just want to clarify that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congress stands at a pivotal moment to strengthen the U.S.-Taiwan economic and trade relationship. Over the past few decades, Taiwan's role as a critical U.S. partner in investment, supply chain, science and technology, health, and education has grown. An example of our enduring friendship can be found in Los Angeles, where the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office of Los Angeles supported our pandemic recovery efforts and our public institutions of higher education. When Los Angeles was on the front lines of combating high rates of COVID transmission, Taiwan made numerous donations of PPE to schools and first responders in the county. To cultivate U.S.-Taiwan relations in academia, Taiko LA contributed $2 million to the UCLA uh, Asian Pacific Center to support the Ta Taiwan Studies Program, one of the most active and vibrant centers for the study of Taiwan in the United States. Our shared democratic values and intercultural exchanges make Taiwan an ideal partner to strengthen commercial ties with. Over the past few decades, Taiwan's labor movement coincided with the political democratization of their government. However, as Ms. Bader Blau identified in her testimony, Taiwan must take additional measures to protect workers' rights in law and in practice. Ms. Bader Blau, how do, you, how do strong independent trade unions contribute to a sustainable democracy and fair trade policies? Thank you for that question. I would start by saying around the world, labor rights are the most frequently violated set of human rights. And indeed, when we uh, shore up workers and their rights to organize, bargain, represent um, communities, we strengthen the work uh, the voices of grassroots citizens in any one country, including the most disenfranchised people, the poorest, the indigenous people, and uh, women. And so um, a, a really important a role that labor plays and in, in, in labor rights play in promoting and shoring up sustainable democracy is giving voice to the most voiceless in most of our societies. And I would say that in the case of Taiwan, while we have had enormous um, progress and moved ahead um, and a commitment to democracy and an open society, there's so much room to improve 
the um, extension of fundamental labor rights to all categories of Taiwanese workers so that we have economic fairness in the country and not just the, all the money that comes out of expanded trade going to the wealthiest and the corporations. I think there's a huge opportunity in this conversation to highlight uh, the advocacy and organizing work of organized labor in Taiwan to achieve that aim. And that's the point, that deepening economic ties with Taiwan serves as an opportunity to promote labor standards in the United States, Taiwan, and throughout the Pacific region. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Peter Blau, does Taiwan have the potential to serve as a regional leader for the labor movement in, in Asia? And how can Congress support capacity building in Taiwan? Taiwan, by virtue of um, its very important and large uh, corporations that operate across Asia, in many countries where we're experiencing closing civic space, authoritarian government, right-wing populism, and lack of labor rights, Taiwan's companies unfortunately too often play into that abuse by not exercising uh, their ability to uh, control the behavior of suppliers across their supply chains. We see human rights abuse in Taiwanese manufacturing and it goes unchecked with impunity. I think Taiwan has an opportunity to directly address the behavior of its corporations and supply chains by adopting the UN um, principles, guiding principles on human rights and business and human rights, where states have a duty prote to protect uh, workers and, and people of human rights where business has the uh, need and, and requirement to respect the rights of workers and people, and that whenever people are harmed, there is remedy. Those principles could be applied to Taiwan's uh, supply chains, and it would make an enormous difference in the lives of many, many thousands of uh, working people across South Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And oftentimes, people don't view strength and economic ties or trade as a means to uplifting workers. They believe that it's only the, the negative. But have we proven um, with the renegotiated USMCA and, but, and the implementation and the follow through that we can use those agreements to force or to encourage our trading partners to uplift, to live by the standards that we agreed in those agreements. Um, in the end, I know these are complex issues, but I know that we are better off with a strong trading and economic partnership with Taiwan. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal. And thank you, all of y'all, for being here for well over four hours to discuss with us something that we all care very much about. Taiwan is important to us. They're our democratic partner in the Indo-Pacific region. And we must do more to ensure our continued economic and security relationship. Like so many in this room, I'm frustrated with the Biden administration's lack of a coherent trade strategy. We must act swiftly and decisively to combat China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific. I recently returned from heading a CODEL with my colleagues where we visited Cambodia and Singapore. And these countries are anxious for U.S. trade leadership in the region. They have industries that want increased access to the U.S. markets, and we need to stand ready to work with them. The story that I heard from across the economic spectrum of the ASEAN countries is that the U.S. involvement and American investment is critical to create an open and prosperous region. The United States must take a leadership role with these countries or our competitors will. So they'll fill the vacuum if we don't. And by not including all countries in the ASEAN regional trade negotiations, we are risking splintering the fastest growing trade bloc in the world. And I understand the administration is working on IPEF as well as another separate negotiation with Taiwan. And while I'm glad that we're beginning to engage in the region, I remain very concerned about the lack of congressional consultation for these agreements. The Constitution grants Congress with the authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations. Without trade promotion authority, any agreement led by the administration lacks the trade tools necessary to provide true market access to these nations. There are many avenues in which the U.S. can strengthen our trade with Taiwan, and I think we have a huge opportunity 
for the U.S.-Taiwan energy cooperation. In 2021, Taiwan imported 97.4 percent of its energy, and while it is working on decarbonizing its economy, we have another opportunity to work together on carbon capture technology. Last year, my colleague Darren LaHood and I introduced the U.S. trade leadership in the Indo-Pacific and China Act. This bill asserts that the United States should play a sustained role in establishing an open, rules-based trading system in the Indo-Pacific and that the United States should have a long-term strategy for maintaining a balanced trading relationship with China. I think our legislation lays it out in a clear path for the United States trading engagement in the region. Engagement with Taiwan is key in these goals. Mr. Glasser, sorry, Ms. Glasser, in your testimony, you discuss U.S. trade leadership in the Indo-Pacific. How important is trade promotion authority for securing a long-lasting trade deal with Taiwan? Well, I think that um, ultimately having a TPA would be the best way to go. But I, too, am glad that at least this administration has gotten started talking uh, with Taiwan about trade issues. We spent four years uh, in the Trump administration where we actually had no talks with Taiwan about trade issues. And so, we're, I, 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 Mr. Wu has said earlier, there's a belief that we can get some early harvest um, actions, we can get something done in the short run, but ultimately, I think we need a comprehensive trade agreement with Taiwan, and that should be done, of course, with Congress um, and, uh, and Trade Promotion Authority. Thank you. Mr. Wu, how do you think the U.S. and Taiwan can further trade cooperation with energy? Um, I think this is an important front for exactly what you highlighted in terms of Taiwan's dependence on foreign energy. Right? So certainly, um, I think in terms of making sure the infrastructure is in place for LNG, LNG transport, and so forth, um, I think Taiwan's willingness to um, support a global effort in terms of making sure Europe has access to that has been critical for that. So bringing Taiwan into those discussions about ensuring right, the global energy crisis that we're facing in Europe doesn't get cut off. And then looking at diversification of sources uh, beyond just U.S. and other places as well. Um, I think all of those are important. Renewables, I think, is also an important part of that, but that's several years off, and we need to look at uh, crises that Taiwan may face in the near term. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlelady. We now have seven votes on the floor. If the witnesses are available and the members are able, we will come back uh, after the seven votes are completed. For the moment, the Ways and Means Committee stands in recess.
Yeah. I did too. <laughs> 32 years. So let us reconvene the Ways and Means Committee and to thank our witnesses for being uh, not only superb in your testimony, but the patience. This is really nice that the courtesy you've extended to us. And with that, let me recognize the gentleman from North Carolina to inquire, Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And guys, thank you for your patience. I know it's been a little bit of a long afternoon. I'll try to, try to keep it short. Um, obviously, trade is something crucial literally to almost every single district in this country. It's important to our country. It's important to the international community. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I think it's at least on this side of the aisle general consensus that while the Biden administration has done what they can, they, they should have done a lot. They should have and can do a lot more. I mean, we have some differences in agreement on priorities of this administration, and we know that every single facet of our economy depends upon trade, depends upon trade. So um, I, I will say this. I had a great time. I live in eastern North Carolina, and we got a lot of chickens. We got a lot of hogs, and we're actually the number, number two hog-producing district in the country. And I just want to say for the record that eastern North Carolina barbecue is the best in the country. Can that be submitted, Mr. Chairman? Okay, so all right. <laughs> okay, but uh, last week I, I met with a bunch of farmers and uh, it was a great time. It was a great time listening to their concerns about feed and all the other things, but also listening to concerns about where their product goes. How do they get it out? Who's going to pick it up? What barriers are restricted to, uh, to their trade and getting things out? So obviously um, we need to export um, our product and so many of those folks depend upon that livelihood. So. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about Taiwan and some of the restrictive uh, policies and some of the other, um, other countries, for that matter. Let me, let me ask one thing specifically, and then I'll get a little bit more general, and this is to Mr. Wu. Uh, I'm talking about the MRL policy, okay, just where we're talking about the maximum residual limit policy. And I know this is something that some countries have had a problem with. Can you, uh, can you speak a little bit more, and, or have you or have you not heard any concerns about Taiwan and specifically to this? And if you have, what can we do about it to really address those concerns so we can put our product in that country? Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Murphy. Um, certainly, uh, the MRL issue has been an impediment to our farmers. Uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is, right, there have been global standards that have been pushed forward with Codex Alimentarius. And Taiwan has, um, through different types of regulatory focuses, and this is why I emphasized in my testimony the importance of looking at regulatory measures, right, has used that as a way to slow down entry or to even block entry. And while I know there's been some progress made on pork and beef, it really just depends on the specific nature of the product. And that's where I think trade negotiations, having locking in a risk-based, science-based approach that's aligned with global standards can really serve the interests of our exporters, including the constituents in your district. Yeah. Well, thank you. I just, I really, really think this administration could, could do a better job with that because, you know, Ms. Glacier, you, you commented a little earlier, you have great optimism uh, about this in the next five to ten years. I wish I could could share that optimism. I just don't think that the uh, socioeconomic conditions, or rather the geopolitical conditions, really are going to favor that. Hopefully you're, mo you're more right than I am. So um, finally, I'm just going to ask, really, if anybody has any concerns about uh, the Communist Party's restrictive access. How do we move forward because of what the geopolitical uh, condition is with um, China and Taiwan? How do we keep trying to keep that market open for Taiwan, knowing that the Chinese would like to choke it off as much as possible? I'll ask Ms. Glacier that first. Well, the Chinese continue to pursue policies that increase Taiwan's dependence on China. And uh, they do want to, uh, as you say, choke off uh, Taiwan's interactions with the rest of the world. And there are, of course, many things that we can do to try and increase that interaction. Um, trade is one area that we have a great deal under our control. If we talk about encouraging Taiwan's participation in the UN, UN organizations, China's a member and it blocks Taiwan everywhere. Um, so that becomes more difficult. So I think we really should focus on the areas where we can have the most impact. 
And I really believe that trade is one of them. When we sit down and negotiate a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan, it's us and it's them working out what is in the best interests of our two countries. Precisely. I agree completely. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. With that, I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the ranking member for holding this hearing, and thank you for the perseverance of our witnesses through this. I have some very specific questions about some issues related um, to the relationship between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. In February of 2018, the PRC government announced 31 measures again, and again in November 2019, introduced an additional 26 measures to attract firms and talent from Taiwan to China with a, with a focus on advanced technology. I'm very interested in technology. It is, I believe, the future of the United States. And so our relationship with Taiwan in terms of how we utilize technology and provide support and trade is important. What's the significance of these types of efforts by the People's Republic of China to deepen trade investment technology and talent ties between China and Taiwan? Do any of the witnesses have anything like that? And how has China sought to leverage Taiwan's capabilities in the semiconductor industry? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman, for your question. I, I think uh, talent and the ability to attract talent from Taiwan has been a key part of China's strategy. And so they're dangling everything from research labs to money to market access, right, to profits in this effort. And we have to recognize that it is a global war for talent, and we need to have attractive counter elements to that. And we should recognize some of this talent is actually American educated, where we have to create a welcome conditions for immigrants from Taiwan and elsewhere to stay and be part of our ecosystem rather than uh, the and communist ecosystem. And have they been ecosystem. successful in this attraction, do you believe? I, I think if you look at, right, uh, who, who's the talent behind, say, right, one of the leading foundries in mainland China, SMIC, right, uh, a lot of that has been Taiwanese talent. If you look at who are some of the people building out biotech and so on and so forth, right, that talent is being attracted from overseas, including, right, who's helping to build out the mRNA vaccine, uh, the efforts are coming from China. So it's not targeted just at Taiwanese, it's targeted at people all around the world of Chinese origin. Um, and I think we need to, uh, by strengthening our ties, by tying this in and focusing on right, export controls, critical technologies, but also soft power policies, including our own immigration policies, talent attraction, ability, free movement of Thai tech workers between Taiwan and the United States. I think all of that's very important. Well, how has um, Taiwan's industry and the Taiwanese government responded to such efforts, um, either with regard to new restrictions or efforts to promote trade and investment um, diversification? I know their new southbound policy, for example, seeks to promote Taiwan economic ties with countries in the Southeast Asia, South Asia, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. What are the, your assessments of their efforts to retain that talent um, there in Taiwan? I think Taiwan has tried. Um, in some sectors, it's been more successful than others. So in semiconductors, it actually has been one. It's been very successful. Um, I don't think the southbound uh, policy right, uh, has worked uh, as a counterweight to what the PRC offers. It hasn't worked in this administration. It didn't work in the Lee administration when the first iteration of this took place. Um, and so I think it does require, as I stated in my testimony, that Taiwan have a counterweight of advanced economies, ourselves, Japan, our, our allies in NATO, and so forth, because that's really going to be the gravitational fall. ASEAN and what it offers, as attractive as they may, is not going to be a sufficient counterweight for talent retention. Thank you. And unless any of the witnesses have any other responses to that, I guess my last question would be, how is the United States then working with Taiwan to deepen the tech? You know, we're looking at talent in that respect. But in terms of our supply chain issues, how is that affecting that? And are there ways or additional support that the United States government, and particularly Congress, can do to support those issues? The United States is already doing quite a bit in terms of uh, ensuring right, that we have this open uh, environment, uh, particularly to attract 
and to provide the types of subsidies uh, or the other types of talent retention policies, including the CHIPS Act. But that's just one sector. We need to be doing this across the board. We need to be making sure that there's regulatory certainty about that. And as I've touched on earlier, we need to be doing this with a array of other issues, including right, on immigration issues, including on export control, investment screening. So there's a lot more we could be doing, including what Congress has power and oversight over to be doing to ensure that there is this tighter integration of supply chains and talent across these areas. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And um, Mr. Chair, I'm just grateful that we're having this discussion. I think in areas not just of the semiconductors, biotechnology, other areas that this is really key to increasing American uh, excellence in this area. And Taiwan is, of course, a huge partner with us to be able to do that, not just in terms of talent, but the actual product that comes out of it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank the gentlelady. Everybody. So we will conclude, conclude with the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening the hearing today. Thank you to the, to the witnesses. I'm, I'm cognizant that you've been here a long time today. I will say I've learned a lot. I think we've all learned a lot, and we appreciate you testifying today. We know that the Constitution gives authority to Congress to regulate commerce with, with foreign countries. And I don't think there's any doubt that successful trade policy or strategy depends on, in my opinion, extensive engagement between the legislative branch and the executive branch. We've not had that coherent trade strategy since January of 2021. And since President Biden has taken office, he really has been unwilling to carry out a forward-looking aggressive trade policy. That lack of engagement on trade is not only bad economic policy, it's also a threat to our national security. So, Mr. Wu, with that, uh, and I want to go back to your testimony, and I've been here the whole time. I don't think this has been touched on. Your statements about uh, Taiwan and the currency manipulation that's going on. Two questions, and, and the first one may be at 30,000 feet. Characterize the currency manipulation, and secondly, what can we do, uh, what can the administration do to thwart the currency manipulation carried out by Taiwan? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. It's an important issue because, as we know, currency, tax, and so forth all affect trade and competitiveness. Um, so uh, the, what I wanted to highlight in my testimony is there has certainly been intervention by Taiwan Central Bank, as there are, are interventions by all central banks in currency markets. Um, but there has been concern expressed at numerous times across different administrations in the Treasury Department, which monitors this, that that intervention may be artificially keeping the new Taiwan dollar at levels lower than what the market would otherwise suggest. Um, I think it's important that this be an issue that is focused on across the board, just as uh, was highlighted on labor by Ms. Bader Blau, um, that you know we don't just allow our friends a pass on these types of issues. And so I think this is both something that we need to be focused on, but it's also an opportunity for us to set high standards in this agreement that can be used on with other uh, trade agreements, including in IPAF, and for us to recognize that having strong disciplines on this front, having agreed upon cooperation on this front, um, is in the interests of our workers. So if I can, let me take it a, a step further for people who are, who are watching. Talk about how that currency manipulation by Taiwan affects, uh, affects our exporters and affects our imports. Certainly, I'd be happy to do so. So if the new Taiwan dollar is at a rate that is uh, artificially lower than it, what it should otherwise be. That makes American products more expensive than they would otherwise be in Taiwan. That then depresses uh, demand for that uh, amongst uh, Taiwanese consumers. So uh, the flip side is true when it comes to exports from Taiwan. Exports from Taiwan would be cheaper than the, what they would otherwise be. Um, and so that increases uh, demand for such imports, but it also shifts investment decisions and so forth as firms make these types of choices about their supply chain. Um, you know, as I said, right, Taiwan Central Bank is not the only central bank that intervenes 
uh, in this manner, but it's important that we have agreed upon global standards uh, on what's permissible, what's not permissible by central banks, because this does affect our trade competitiveness. It's about ensuring a level playing field again, uh, along common rules and making sure that that can't be undermined uh, through actions outside of the trade area. And that's why I urge that we need to be focused on this with friends, with adversaries across the board on this in terms of ensuring that American firms, American workers have a level playing field around the world. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Also, going back to your testimony, if I can, can you characterize, if you know, the level of intellectual property theft that, that goes on, uh, carried out by the Taiwanese? Sure. Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. It's an important question. Uh, I think there certainly have been improvements in Taiwan in its IP regime. Um, that's both with regards to the laws on the books as well as enforcement. And one way we can see this is in the special 301 report that's issued by the Office of U.S. Trade Representative through the President. Right, Taiwan um, has not been uh, viewed as, as egregious an offender. That being said, right, there are still concerns about copyright, about trade secrets, and particularly about economic espionage. And that's why I urged in my testimony for very strong disciplines and cooperation, on, uh, especially criminal enforcement with regards to economic espionage. Thank you. thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, let me especially thank our witnesses today. You've been more than generous with your time. And please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. And with that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, job. Good job. Good job. Thanks, Dave.